Welcome into the Ryan Ripken Show episode, I 
guess it's 70 now, technically being specific. Uh, new time today. We're doing this earlier just because of the scheduling. It is an off day for the Baltimore Orioles, but we have a jam-packed show for you. So to let you know what's happening for this show, we have we're going to talk a little bit about this past weekend, just because there's a lot of things that happened in the sports world. We can't just talk all Orioles and baseball, which I promise you we're going to talk a lot about, especially with our guests. At five o'clock, we have Jeff Passan. When you are on Twitter, you know who that is. If, if, if they call it what a a Passan bomb, he is going to join us at five p.m. to talk about some news around MLB and obviously the Baltimore Orioles. And then pro arguably there's a lot of hot hitters in the Orioles organization, but the hottest probably statistically all the way across the board, Heston Kerstad is going to join us later on to talk about his hot start and maybe just some other fun things with him. And then we'll sprinkle in as the O's prepare for their first divisional series of the year up at Fenway Park. That series begins tomorrow, Tuesday to Thursday, as they try to get back on track. Uh, and to let you know then, if you're tuning in on the YouTube, thank you guys. I see and let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd love to know where you're tuning in from. And if you are listening on Spotify or Apple, please, please leave us a review. We're trying to get that growing more and more for you guys. All right, that's a lot to breathe. Let's go around with who's with us today from right to left. We got Zoe. That's Brad. Left to right, Brad. Hey, Brad's here. Sorry about that. I'm out of focus today. We'll fix it. <laughs> What's up, fellas? And then going to the right, now we'll go to the right. We got Zach Bollinger and Kevin Ostriker is finally back from the grave. Oh, uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Wait a minute. Kind of back from the grave, but try yeah. now. Nope. nope. Yeah, we'll figure it this out. This is why we this is why we do it early. Uh, we don't need Kevin. Happy uh one shining moment day to everyone who observes. Yep, it is great. Well, also, why don't we not forget about Rocco here for the second? Rocco's hiding in the back. Oh, well, we'll, we'll let at Rocco back in. Rocco, how are we doing? What's up, boys? How are we? Big uh, show ahead. Pumped for this one. We, we big, big show ahead. And of course, it's never a Ryan Ripken show unless I do something wrong. Kevin, speak again. Nope, not yet. Don't speak. Never mind. Uh, it's never, it's never a Ryan Ripken show unless we have some sort of technical difficulty. But Kevin has recovered, and we are happy to have him back. Uh, but Zach, why don't we, before we get into a little bit more of the, what we're going to talk about in baseball, there was a lot that happened. There was WrestleMania rock that you were at last night. First off. Oh yeah. Was, was it, I mean, Zach was following the storylines right there with you. Yeah, yeah. Last night, Rocco, you can talk about it, but it just even viewing it from the television, I've not watched like WWE, like regularly in like over 10 years. Last night was single-handedly like the best wrestling I've ever seen. It felt like everyone that I enjoyed watching when I was a kid just showed up out of nowhere. Absolutely electric. Cody Rhodes finishes the story. Didn't even know we were finishing a story until like 48 hours ago, but that shit's finished. Mark it down. Yeah, man. I'm right there with you on that. I, I'm not a big wrestling guy. Can't say that I watch it religiously. Like my brother, he's a diehard. He is actually a professional wrestler. He wrestles the Monster Factory. So he is basically immersed in this lifestyle, and he absolutely loves it. And I'm asking him questions the whole time. I'm like, is this guy going to have pyro for a celebration or his introduction? What's the deal with this? What's the storyline here? So, Zach, I have no clue about it. But I'm telling you what, man, being there in person, the atmosphere was awesome. Everyone stood up, sat down at the same time, chanted the same chants. Um, it was a once in a lifetime thing for us, for sure. And if, if you haven't gone, if the tickets are ever reasonably priced and maybe at M&T Bank Stadium or somewhere in the area, you have to, have to, have to go to WrestleMania and check it out. It was awesome. When the Undertaker came back, that was him and yeah. Cena. Those are the two, like... I have a video on my phone where I am screaming at the top of my life, like, ah, ah, when the Undertaker comes out, when you hear the bell, you can just hear me scream because it's like, dude, that was one of my favorite wrestlers as a kid. And to see him back, even if it was for like a split second, lights pop on, he choke slams the rock. It was really, really cool. And then Cena, like you talked about, incredible. Yeah, you know what? Also, we need oh my camera's out again. God, but damn it. We're having a really good technical difficulty day so far as well. Kevin talk. Yeah, yeah no, I'm oh, I'm, Kevin, I'm back, back officially back from yeah. the break. Look at me. Look at me. It was uh was a rough week. I mean, I'm still not a hundred a hundred percent, but obviously to the point now where I can talk again. And uh, you know, thank you for all the support and the well wishes. I know we had a bit of a Kevin after dark. Um 
especially during that live stream we did a couple of days ago and I uh, came on there, no camera and everything and uh, show, show, showed how badly it was, but now we're, we're pretty much back at this point. So glad to be back with the boys. Yeah. And Rocky, you want to talk about a little bit like your brother was interviewed about like WrestleMania and stuff. Dude, my brother is more famous than I'll ever be in my life. First of all, he's, if, if you haven't like the people that are in this chat right now, if you like wrestling or even if you don't like wrestling, Go check out the Monster Factory on Apple TV. My brother is actually one of the stars in the show. So he's got like the IMDB page, I'm pretty sure, and everything he might not, but like he might have to have one soon. But he actually, Jason Kelsey and Lane Johnson of the Philadelphia Eagles, they went to the Monster Factory. Danny Cage runs it, does a great job. And those two guys were training with my brother and a bunch of other wrestlers. And, you know, while they didn't wrestle for a long time at WrestleMania, they just came out for a little bit. They, they were you know, learning about the ins and outs, how to take bumps, how to do this and that. So um, I posted the story that the Philadelphia Inquirer did with my brother. It's a really great story. Matt Breen did a hell of a job. And he just got interviewed by uh, NBC, the NBC 10 in Philadelphia as well. So Lucas, my buddies were telling me in the group chat, it's like the stock on Rocco is going down. The stock on Lucas, it continues to rise. So his wrestler in Switch, go check him out. Hell yeah, we're good. Sorry, you know what? Also, maybe we're in the theme of WrestleMania. That's why you couldn't see me on the the camera. Oh, God, what yeah. a save! Yeah. There it is. Good job. A little Undertaker, <laughs> like the, it goes out and then Ryan just reappears. Yes, but like, go, but go check out. It's Lucas Twitch DeSangro. Is that what yeah, it is? Yeah, Lucas Twitch DeSangro. Yep, that's his. Uh, his name's Twitch. Oh no. yeah, bro. Hell that yeah. story was awesome. Like we talked to each other every fucking day, and and Rocco just failed to tell that to anybody. Well, yeah. all right. Here's here's the thing. Are you talking about the Kelsey and uh, and Lane Johnson going, or there? just your brother in general? Like, yeah, like yeah, you. My brother's awesome. I didn't I even that. know you were gonna be there until you. Like, I saw pictures. So, like, I just I had yeah. no no idea. And any any so, of this is happening, or that your brother was this heavily involved with Kelsey and, and Lane Johnson. They had to sign an NDA, so they weren't allowed to talk about it at all. So uh, yeah, but I, we're your boys. Like, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, so Man. did you know? We're, it's like circle of trust, you know. <laughs> I, well, exactly. I, knew, I knew like afterwards, like when he was like, yeah, like I trained these guys and I'm like, cause he wasn't uh, before. Yeah. Good it's save, like, good save. like it, it be your own people, man. It's like my brother couldn't even tell me ridiculous. Hey, you know what? Also it's just thinking about it. Hey, we're just, you gotta, Hey, respect your bad, the relationships, respect yeah. what's going on. That's how it is. Joe, you always got to say something was the stock on Rocco ever up. Couldn't resist star. Hey, Sorry. Bro. Joe, you got to be careful today. You better right be careful today, my friend. Not the right show to piss me off, Joe. So if you want to keep it up, you know what's going to happen, and I'll do it at the right time, right when our second guest of the night comes on. So just just keep keep giving me ammo, buddy. You know what's going to happen. So besides that, that WrestleMania was electric. You know, maybe also the technical issues. You know, the eclipse apparently is going on today, right? Uh, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a thing today. Maybe it's there's something's fluctuating that we don't know about, but what we do know about guys. The first national championship for college basketball, the women's, concluded yesterday. Electric. It was at 3 p.m., which people were saying, why was it more primetime on a Sunday? 3 p.m. game, South Carolina State undefeated. The men's play tonight. But, guys, I got to say, I thought the women's tournament overall yeah. this year, fantastic. And Caitlin Clark, her stock of what she's going to do, that what she already did for the women's NCAA ranks, what she's going to do with the WNBA, I'm super excited. And I thought it was so damn cool that Dawn Staley took the time mm -hmm. to recognize and say, thank you for helping to lift up the sport, even though it's a team sport. But obviously, it was evident. Her and Angel Reese. and Oh, and, my uh, God. Like, yeah. it's, it helped build, up, build it up in a positive way. 100%. And the numbers that we saw from this was just absolutely insane. I mean, most viewed Final Four, most viewed championship game. And, uh, you know, they beat... Thursday night football. It'd mm -hmm. be, you know, college football, all of college football, by the way. And it's just, it's been pretty awesome to see. We've been waiting for this. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people were just like, especially, you know, those who kind of preach inequality and what have you. And it's like, okay, well, if, if you're going to preach inequality, go watch the games then. And now it's finally, finally, we're actually seeing these games getting viewed. And so that's where the, that's where the money comes. You want to see equal pay on, on in, in men and women's basketball, men and women's sports. You got to watch it. That's that's really what it comes yeah. down to. Don't sit there and say and complain if you're not watching these games. So I, I love to see that, and and I think that it's going to bring more more dollars their way. And it it's it's just it's just awesome. 
Yeah, I mean, people are now saying, arguably, they said, you know, if depends if you're like a basketball junkie, right? If you're a full, full basketball junkie, you'll know players on your specific teams. Like, if you follow the Maryland Terps, you probably have an idea of, yeah. of what their roster is. But if you were just an average basketball fan, they're saying now you probably could name three or four of the women's stars, but probably could have a tough time naming the three or four men's stars outside of, what, Zach Eady on Purdue and then uh, DJ Burns for NC State? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then... If you could list three, you might know him personally if you watch the game, but you're right. Like the star power and Caitlin Clark launching threes from wherever it's, it's fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. And clearly they did have a lot of viewership it was the most viewed game that they had for Iowa and LSU. It was in the elite eight mm-hmm. was, was absolutely great. So, so many fun things. What else did we miss from this weekend guys? Am I missing something else at the moment? Besides, I know everyone's wants to jump off after the Orioles <laughs> lost besides that news. <laughs> The reactions, bro. Crazy. Oh, man. Absolutely insane. Dude, right. We talked about it. We talked about the renegade dog leading up to this series. And oh. Hugh, the chat yeah. got the quiet. So I want to know more about how that was because cold and tasty, it's not bad. But, like, Cube, was it something? Let us know in the chat if you were able to finish it in one sitting or was it way too much? Because I personally think that all of us here could attack that, be fine, and obviously we'd face the repercussions after the next day, maybe two days after, but it would be well worth it, I feel like. Yeah, I really want to know. At first, another thing, did you do the one-bite challenge, Cube, or did you do it all in multiple <laughs> bites? You know, it's a big dog, <laughs> but one bite, everyone knows the rules, right? So, yeah. Zach, don't look at me that way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Don't you look at me that way for what you were doing before <laughs> we got on air here. And we're not going to talk about it. It was inappropriate. That was ridiculous. What, this, this Rock, is a, the worst is Rocco followed by example. <laughs> Well, you shouldn't set the bad example then. You, you know Rocco's a follower. It's like having the kid that just got copy it. Like I knew like it was like teaching the parrot bad words. It's like that kind of thing. I knew if I did it, Rocco would repeat. But I'm the sad thing is I'm six years older than you, so I shouldn't be. But I did. That's so true. It is all on him. Yeah. Be a better role model for me. Be be better, Rocco. Well, yes. Uh obviously this was another bit of news, but maybe we'll save that for our second guest that's going on. There's some there's some news breaking in college basketball, and I saw a video today of John Calipari uh, walking, and the guy's like, "Oh, hey, you know, you want to comment?" He's like, "Nope, I'm just gonna walk my dog. I'm walking yep. my dog, <laughs> having fun." I think we might be able to find that. That's hilarious. Uh, my dog's walking me. That's he's what it was. Away, bro. He's like, "What?" <laughs> oh gosh, there, there there's been a lot of excitement. Obviously, the men play tonight. UConn Purdue should be a great game. Honestly, can UConn be the defending or can they be the repeat champions? They've looked the part. They've looked dominant. But I'll tell you what, Purdue has made everyone. People still remember that Purdue lost, but they're doing their best job to say, hey, hey, that's in the past. We're one win away from a national championship. We're not the same team we were when we got upset by fairly Dick. It was fairly Dick. Yeah. Fairly Dick mm-hmm. So, right? I mean, talk about what a incredible just storyline going into this it's yes. what do we have do we have a repeat champion and kind of solidifying dan hurley as one of those all-time great coaches or do we have the redemption you know purdue lost to the 16 seed last year almost like a little virginia virginia yes. did it when they lost to uh UNBC. 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 and then the next year they yep. won it all do we see the same thing from purdue uh or do we get the back-to-back champion uh, Clinigan versus Edie is going to be must see TV for 40 minutes. Oh yeah, man. That, but what, what sucks guys is like, I feel like a little bit of an old man here, but nine 30 tip is just yeah. absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> it's like it is. people are going to be struggling to stay up with work tomorrow. It's like, you know, I don't know. I, I really do hate that. It's a nine 30 tip. I wish it was like maybe eight, eight 15, Mm-hmm. Give us like an hour 15, maybe buffer, but 930. That means the game's probably not getting over until 1130 post game until midnight, um, 12, yeah. 15. Like that's kind of ridiculous. I'm not, I'm yeah, not trying we- to be the old guy that yells at the clouds, but come on now. One shining moment's not going to come on till like midnight. And obviously you have to stay up for that. And like, <laughs> well, with me being a Nuggets fan, obviously not to toot my own horn, but that's con- consistently 9 p.m. start times. You also so, go to bed at like 4 a.m. Yeah, so yeah, well, that's like that, that part we didn't have to put in there. But we're, you like, know, it's, we're talking about Kevin's like saw 9 30. He's like, okay, during my lunch break, I can catch yeah, the no, national championship. You game. know, get, get a little leftovers going. Right. <laughs> like, you know, st- start my day. He- heat up the breakfast burrito. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. well, One time we're going to have to take everything everyone throws kevin's day and just the craziness of it <laughs> well, you know your breakfast burrito kev huh 
What's in your breakfast burrito, buddy? We don't want to know. It's probably. Well, my ideal is like so you get some obviously the egg and the cheese, but then you get the sausage. A big. Um, I, I like. Oh, well, <laughs> you were so awesome. <laughs> I. Do you see, do you see how sly that was? I caught myself right at the last second. Good. Right at the last second. <laughs> nope. Yeah, like, wrong answer. I did. It's good Iron Rooster. Oh, you know, where's, where's that? Where's that damn box that I had from Kyle from the Iron Rooster? Yeah, I did. I, I actually think I went there three times last week at least, <laughs> and I was supposed to go today. Whoops! I'll be back for the Iron Rooster. We love the Iron Rooster, but Kevin, maybe maybe we'll have to. You have to show Kyle some of your what what will work for you for a breakfast. Meal oh yeah, oh yeah, the Iron 100%. Rooster. Um, I, I saw a comment here. I don't, Johnny. I don't. Grayson gave who a shout out on foul territory. Um, well. If that's, I have no idea what's going on there, but maybe, maybe if there is some context to it, would be, <laughs> would be great. Uh, sports. Oh, wait, isn't that a show? Yeah. It's the, it's the baseball show. So mm -hmm. I know the show, but yeah, I'm yeah, saying yeah. I don't, the context of if Grayson was talking about me, what did he say about me? Yeah. There's a lot, Ooh. there's a lot of things that could be said. Johnny, did Johnny get his Ripkins confused? Was it like he shouted out a, another Ripkin and it was maybe not Ryan Ripkin? Mm. Siraka, you always want to go that way too. It's what a, a, why can't why can't they shout out Ryan? What a dick! You're such an asshole. <laughs> we we can't wait for the group to get some drinks after this too. Good meeting with yeah. Rocco in studio. It's really we're, good. we're gonna really be good. we're gonna be deciding Rocco's future on the show. Yeah, in, in that meeting. yeah team meeting tonight. Yeah. Everyone's there. Be there. Be square. Yep. And so. And Sorry so if you are just tuning in to the Ryan Rupert Show, hit that like and subscribe button. We have our, our first guest, Jeff Passon, coming up here soon. And if you're on X, follow us on X as well. And we do have the audio component, and I want to touch on that. It's on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcast. Like it, review it, let us know what's going on. And also, by the way, uh, we talked about the day in the life of Kevin. Maybe that can be a part of uh, a behind-the-scenes package that we're going to try to do. I think we're trying to get going even a little bit of subscriptions, not a ton, not a lot, but a little bit more insight to what we do and to continue to build the community. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to build the community and be able to do more for you all. We think it's been fun so far. We hope you've enjoyed the ride, but we have some big aspirations. So we will continue to share that. So stay tuned for more of that this week. Duran, what's up? I told you to say hi to me at Pickles. I meant it and you did. Good to see you on the show. Um, Guys, we will jump into, I think, in between our first guest talking about the Orioles. And I understand that everyone wants to jump off the bridge. Oh, 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 so oh. He, he did. I mean, still mentioned new ownership. Hell yeah. Nice. Yeah. I was wrong. I apologize, Ryan. No, you don't. I'll never, I will never doubt you again. I'll never yeah, it'll, it'll be discussed at the team meeting. Yep. <laughs> No, I'm. You know what? I'm driving down. I'm driving down for the team meeting. I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna ditch Ariana tonight. I will. I will be in my spot when I need to be in my spot. Talking. Yeah, that'll be a cold day in hell. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna ditch Ariana. Yeah, sure. Choose you are. your poison, buddy. Yeah, I'm actually yeah, in her yeah. apartment right now, so I kind of. We know. <laughs> we we are. Hey, we did are... you did you know did you know that Rocco actually covered the Iron Bowl? Did you? <laughs> Oh, sure. Did you know that? Oh, uh, well, well. Breaking news. Brad, you look like you coach at Auburn. Well, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> did you, you, know, did you interview Brad? What? Yeah, did you want to interview me? I got okay. nipples, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. What, a line. Movie, what movie? What movie, that's Rocco? What movie? what movie for me? It's yeah, what was Fockers. that movie? Meet, was it Meet the Parents or Meet the Fockers? Which one was it? I forget. It was. Meet, the top. It was. It was, it was, it was it in was that friends. franchise. It's a, it's a, you, you, we'll give you. The, we'll give you the correct answer there. Yeah. But we're going to dive into. We're getting off tra topic again here. It's what's new here. <laughs> but we will talk more. But I just. This is one thing because we'll talk about the Orioles series in a second. But just because if I'm reading this correctly on on X and Twitter, that if you are struggling so far this season, you should be demoted, get off the team. So, and we already know yes. there's a few players on the Orioles where they're saying. Get those guys off the squad. They're terrible. So why don't we go around the league and tell the rest of the organizations to bench these specific players? This should be fun. Um, so, by the way, we know everyone's going Austin Hayes. Austin Hayes, get out of here. Well, guess what? Why don't we get rid of Francisco, Francisco Lindor in New York? Mets, trade him. He's hitting .083 at the moment. Um, uh, J.P. Crawford, 128. Nick Castellanos, pretty big part of the Phillies, right? Yeah, he doesn't even have an extra base hit this year. Yeah, and he's hitting 133. I think his time's up. I think his time is up. We want to go down the list. 
We got yeah. Cedric Mullins is on. We got Cedric Mullins on there. We got Bo Bichette hitting below 200. Um, should I keep going on some other names? Oh, we have Vlad Guerrero Jr. is also on that list. Pete Alonzo. Send him down. Send send him Cut down. Cut them all. Yep. So uh, the only time I'm bringing this up now, everyone, is just because I want people to understand it's a long season. And I know that there was a lot of emotions. The roller coaster that was the Pirates and Orioles series. We will talk more about that, I promise, after this. So everything will be all good and ready to go. Um, and again, before we get going more, hit that like and subscribe button. Ryan Rick and Show. We do it. I didn't even say when we do this. We do this every Monday <laughs> and Thursday. We will sprinkle in on Sundays when there's games on Mondays for the Orioles because then we'll preview the series. But since there's not, we will preview the Red Sox and the Orioles later on in the show today. Um, I think that that's it. We yeah. Hey, we, we crossed over 7,000 this, uh, this weekend, too. We did. We did. And nope. that was I, I didn't clap at all last week. I'll clap for that. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> hey, yeah. Hey. Thanks, Kevin. About time. <laughs> all right, guys. Why don't we get ready to uh, to welcome our, our guest here, first guest on the show. Uh, you guys know, because I love the fact, and he's right, he bombs automatically when he's on ESPN or on X, I should say. He's on ESPN quite a bit. But I think what I love about him is that his baseball knowledge, he's fun, he's enthusiastic about the topic. And he's very in tune with what's going on. I think that's what's exciting for me to talk, to have him come on. So if we don't mind bringing him from behind, it's Whoa, Mr. Jeff uh, Pass. Jesus Christ. I, okay, that's not. God damn it, Ryan. You can't take it to a different level. There you go. Jeff, <laughs> sorry. Wrong choice of words right off the gate. But how are you doing? <laughs> the front, behind, you know, whatever works for everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a new day and age. But Jeff, appreciate it. And actually, I'll let you think about this while we have you on. But we had uh, Buster and Kirchin on in the past, and we brought up some – I know you love have a love for naming random baseball players and all that, but we brought up some old stories, and, and the name that I brought up was Armando Benitez, Drillantino oh, yeah. Martinez, not just in New York, but it had some history where Armando Drilltino in Seattle and that whole situation. So if you have some stories of some random guys that you love to share, uh, we would love to hear it because I, I always go down a rabbit hole with that. So do you have one off the top, or, or I can save that for you for later? No, my random guy is Tommy Hinzo. Um, this is going back to, like, mid-'80s, and I'm growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, and the Indians just suck. And so, like, my early days at old Cleveland Stadium, you know, it, it's a terrible place to watch a baseball game. There are, like, poles everywhere, and Tommy Hinzo, um, I – I think he hit two career home runs. I, I, it might have been one. It might have been three. It's somewhere in that vicinity. But like little it's four, three. five, six-year-old me is yelling, hit a home run, Tommy. And Tommy <laughs> Hinzo hits a fucking home run. And when <laughs> Tommy yeah. Hinzo hits a home run, I go absolutely nuts. Like I have no idea how rare this actually is. But as a kid – He's a big leaguer. Of course, everyone hits home runs. And so that Tommy Hinzo will always be my guy. And I'm very appreciative that in that one moment, he made me feel smart as a baseball fan. And, that, you know, we all have like our things where we get hooked on the game. That moment right there is what hooked me on baseball. See, see, like that's the shit that we love. Like those are the moments. And yeah, that was a guy that played looking it up right now with Tommy. He had 280 plate appearances in 1987. And then he only had 18 games in 89. That was it for his big league Okay, career. so yeah, it must have been – it was 87 then, so I was six years old at the time. So that that tracks. And how many career home runs was it? Was it two? It's three. Three, okay. <laughs> My, a negative .2 war, but when Jeff Hassan's in there, power hitter. So I was going to say, he, he was uh, – you know what? He was a negative .4 war for the career games where I was not in attendance. So it was perfect. <laughs> That, that And that's what we need. I, you know, I was thinking about when my dad's final year, I wanted I, – I was able to – at least my dad said, hey, is there a player that you want uh, from the opposing team? You know, jerseys. Like when it was Seattle, I got Ichiro's. It was his rookie year. That was incredible. I think we went around like I went in Boston, New York with Jeter. I think Boston was Nomar, I believe. But then we went to the Marlins, and I forget who was on the list. But I said, I want Charles Johnson, who was maybe the starting catcher or backup catcher. My dad's like, oh, yeah. do you want – one of the other stars on the team, I think like Mike Lowell might have been there or, or Miguel Cabrera just come up there and they had success. I'm like, nope, Charles Johnson. Give me Charles. Charles Johnson, Charles Johnson was the man. 
Charles yeah. Johnson also, I believe, was the last full-time Black American catcher in yeah. Major League Baseball. And the fact that we are like 20 years plus after his career ended, it's one of those very odd things about baseball. I don't understand why there are not – well, but this is this is going to get us on a whole different topic, why there aren't as many Black players mm. now. And, and yeah. it's an important topic, and it's one that needs to be addressed. But the, the black catcher and the lack of black catchers is a, a very weird thing in baseball. Yeah, yeah. Is, it, is it like running backs in football? You know, like it just a, it's just a thing that like cultures just go to specific yeah. positions that they don't want to play anything else. Or like white, white cornerbacks. White, wide receivers or whatever, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, it, I, I wonder I, if it's something similar to that or not. By the way, I, 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 I don't I don't, I don't know, know the that. answer to that. All I know is my son's high school team, both of the catchers are black kids, and I love it. It's great oh, to see. Yes. There we go. Hell yes. yeah. Well, Charles Johnson, the connection was because he was my dad's teammate, and that's why I wanted this jersey uh, so bad. I was like, Charles, okay. I, I, I had the connection. My dad's like, well, there's some really good players. I'm like, no, like Charles is the man. Like Charles was the man when I was a kid. And now I was going back, I guess, at that point, I was seven or eight years old. All right, let's talk a little bit about kind of what's going on right now. And actually, you wrote an article about it, which I thought was great. And you're really in tune with these things. And personally, for me, just going through the systems and the minors and being around and, and being teammates with guys on the Orioles specifically, Kyle Bradish is a guy that's dealing with a UCL injury. Yeah. Then we're looking at Spencer Strider's done, Perez is done, Bieber's done. You got Garrett Cole that is – you know, who knows the timeline there. And you talked about it in the article, and you've been very diligent on this over the years. Training has changed. Rules have changed. But it doesn't seem like this is ultimately moving the best way for these pitchers and the sport of baseball long term. No, it's it's really problematic. And like this, you know, for me, this issue personally goes back more than a decade now. I was... It was 2012, I think it was right around July or so. And I had talked with some people uh, in the Orioles at the time, among them, like the way that they were babying their pitchers in the minor leagues. It was Dylan Bundy uh, with the Orioles at the time. And, you know, he had thrown 100, I believe 170 something pitches in a high school game. And so, of course, those were like taking a lot of caution with him. But, in addition to that, the the Blue Jays at the time had uh, Noah Syndergaard, Aaron Sanchez, and Justin Nicolino. And I asked Alex Anthopoulos, who was running the Blue Jays, like, why are you doing this? Like, why are you limiting them to, you know, one, two innings at a time? How are you going to build them up to be big league starters, guys who ostensibly should be going seven, eight, nine innings if they're going only one or two innings in their formative years? And his answer was really telling to me and, and really honest. And I appreciate it in hindsight because he said, I don't know. And and he didn't say it like to be flip or to, you know, to sound ignorant. He actually didn't know what the answer was. And I think it's a very human thing that when you see somebody getting injured doing something, you believe that doing less of it is going to get them injured less frequently. As we've seen, that is decidedly not the case because guys are going shorter than ever in their starts and they're getting hurt more than ever now. And what the actual cause of that is, I wish I had the answer to. I spent four years, four years trying to answer that question for my book. And it was it was the part where I look back now on not just that time spent, but like the, the finished product itself. And I'm really proud of a lot of it. And I think, you know, a lot of it holds up still eight years later. But I was at that point and I'm still now dissatisfied that I never came to a conclusion on what exactly it is. Like, did I not look into it deep enough? Did I not do enough research? Did I not talk with the right people? I, I think the answer is there's really not a panacea out there. There's not something that's going to keep all guys healthy. But what I think we have learned is that, Throwing extraordinarily hard is in almost all cases going to wind up with your ulnar collateral ligament shredded. And maybe it takes a little while longer with some guys. You know, Justin Verlander's lasted until past his 40th birthday. Um, but most, like most, it's going to happen pretty early. And Strider, if he needs another Tommy John, that'll be his second by the time he's 25 years old. 
I, I look at Grayson Rodriguez right now and I worry about him because when yeah. you look at the guys who are top 10, top 15, top 20 in average fastball velocity over the last four or five seasons, it's like 70% of them have needed Tommy John and Rodriguez is on that list. And so, you know, the, like, like the part that to me I can't fathom is knowing you are so good at something that it's going to harm you. Yeah. Like, how do you go out there as a pitcher every time and go and execute the way that you've been taught to while understanding that that very execution could ultimately lead to your demise? It's a ridiculous conceit. And, and it puts pitchers in such an enormously bad position that that's why I think everybody needs to be involved in this. It needs to be players. It needs to be the league. It needs to be youth organizations. It needs to be everyone at all levels of baseball trying to understand the arm better and trying to, if not entirely solve this problem, then at least address it in a meaningful way. Yeah. You know, and I, um, you know, it, it's it is crazy when you think about it that way because it the, the ticking time bomb reference has been the new theme. Now, Tommy John, as you know, Jeff, and you've mentioned it, Tommy John surgery is not the end all that it was or the situation it was decades ago. When you had a right. UCL injury, it was your career possibly is done. But the yep. problem is, and you I, you've mentioned it before, I've seen if you have one Tommy John and you have to have another, and then there's another complication. Yes, you could bounce back, but it further could harm you and it doesn't mean that you're going to get back to that point another example and just the last follow-up but the year i got drafted and signed i think it was 2014 the marlins mm -hmm. had a pitcher named tyler kolik that was throwing a hundred oh, i remember you yep. remember him so oh, kolik yeah. number and two then overall pick number two overall pick and tyler kolik never got out i think a double a but i if i'm not mistaken i think he had arm issues but the point where i was going yep. to and same with the bundies guys are throwing even harder at a younger age more stress yep. more strain so I guess in this case, when, when we're looking at it, I guess the last thing I'll ask with this follow-up of it, with baseball, with, with how it is, and people are saying I, the pitch clock issues you've seen in the reports, there's nothing out there, like you said, that's saying that the game's changing. But at what point are they going to have to try to change the philosophy or, or are we already past that point of saying, hey, we're going to have to change it because short-term we might get wins today, but long-term these guys might not be able to go for longer careers that we're hoping for. So I'll try and hit all the points and my memory is not what it used to be, but I will start here. The greatest predictor of a future arm injury is a past arm injury. If you have gotten hurt in the past, you are far likelier to get hurt in the future, which is the scary part of all this, right? That, you know, these guys who are getting injured right now, it's generally not just a one-time thing. And, and we look at Tommy John surgery as, as something of, uh, a miracle surgery because it is. It's been almost too successful. I never thought I would say that about a medical procedure, but it's so good at getting guys to return and a lot of them to return to their previous level that, you know, Scott Boris, when I was reporting the book, said it's a rite of passage now. And uh, that's fucked up. Yeah. Like, yeah. like really? Um, that that you have to have major reconstructive surgery as part of your job is is like is that something that should be written into the script for players' careers? No, but the problem is the more numbers that we've gotten, the more this has been validated that when you throw harder, you succeed more, and so the incentive structure is there at every level for pitchers to try and throw harder. It's there in high school because they know that they're going to get recruited if they hit 90 miles per hour, right? Like if you, mm -hmm. if you throw 90, you will play college ball somewhere. May not be no. high, you know, high major D1, but it will be somewhere and you will be able to play at another level. Uh, then the draft comes along. And if you're throwing 95, you're probably gonna get drafted somewhere. You know, if you can get the ball anywhere near the plate, chances are good that you're going to get drafted. And then if you're in the minor leagues, if you're up to 98, all of a sudden, you know, there are going to be a lot of people who look to, to promote you because if you're hitting 98, well, you can, 
probably hit 100 at some point. If you're hitting 100, you're almost always going to make the big leagues. And so it's there every step along the way. I, I see it. I see it personally because I have a 16-year-old who's a pitcher. And guess what? He wants to throw harder. And and part of me is like, like, hey, work on command. Like, let's yeah. let's see if you let's see if you can dot a fastball on both corners in, in all four quadrants. And you know, when we put your nine pocket out there, I say upper left, lower middle, and, and you can throw it in there. Like, let's do that. But it, it's not that he's looking for shortcuts, it's that he reads the room. Yeah. And and he understands that. Even if he dots his fastball and that makes him a really effective high school pitcher, when it comes to uh, to colleges that are, are looking for guys, maybe they're going to look at the high school numbers. Maybe they'll look at your ERA, your, your strikeout to walk, how many home runs you give up, you know, things like that. But more than anything, a lot of that is a function of the teammates who are surrounding you and uh the radar gun is as objective as it can get mm-hmm. and and when the radar gun says something and that something aligns with what you're looking for in pitchers as it does in so many cases with college coaches who are who are trying to recruit if you want to play college ball you throw harder it's the easiest path toward it and it, it I, is, you know it. i'm not like i'm not saying that going down the easiest path is the right thing to do necessarily but it's the path that most are going to take for, for sure. And, and I, you and I need to talk about this more in the future. Cause this is something I could talk about for hours, especially when I seen guys like Josh Hader was my same high school class, throw 83 yeah. to 85 throwing poo. And then he's getting drafted, but he knew how to pitch. And then yep. he got his velocity, we got into pro ball. And now he's one of the best closers stepped off to a little bit of a rough start, but that doesn't change it. He's one of the That's best right. in the game. Let's go to the fun, uh, a couple fun things then, Jeff, and we'll get you out of here after this. But uh, a couple fun things, then we got to ask you some Oriole things, if that's okay. But I think Rocco has something because you've been, I guess it's you become this over time, but I think it is a fun topic to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, thanks for joining the show. Really appreciate it, man. The What people see when you tweet the passing bombs, it's they just see it pop up on their screens. Many have your notifications on, but I feel like people don't realize or, or know what goes into that. So what I want to ask you is what is the recipe for a pass and bomb first and foremost? And the second part to that question would be, do you realize the aftershock, like what it's going to be after that? Like one fan base is going to be completely happy, just loving you. Like when you broke the Corbin Burns trade, oh, yeah. another fan base could be really, really pissed off. I do realize it. And 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 here's and and here's here's why I I have to because it it grounds me and makes me understand how important it is to get it right. Like that's the thing. I the second that I don't get something right, my credibility vanishes. And so that's where the pressure is in the job, you know. I have to make sure that what I'm putting out there is correct because people rely on me for accurate information. And it's a responsibility. Like it's one I take very seriously because the point you made, like a lot of people have notifications on for me. And if it pops up on their screen, I don't want there to be one second where anyone thinks to him or herself, is this actually right? I'm at the point now where I have the benefit of the doubt from people. And I really appreciate that. And uh, it's, you know, it's a cool place to be. And, And I do know, like, sometimes I'll just sit there like be typing something on my phone and and just be like shit's about to hit the fan like I, <laughs> like i just you know i i know with the big ones especially like okay this is good like this is about to be a good time um and and i you know i appreciate the interaction and i think social media generally speaking for society is a horrendous thing and that the utility may not match the harm that it brings. And it's why I keep my children away from it as much as I can, uh, because I, I see I see how social media emboldens people yep. to act terribly. And, and I don't like that about it. And I don't like the addictive nature of it and how it's built in order to just pull you back in and in and in and spend your days staring at a screen, which mm-hmm. I... I think stinks, but 
I'm also a little bit of a hypocrite in that regard because my job essentially entails me staring at screens all day. So how does something like that happen? It's just, it's years of time and effort and building relationships with people and people trusting you and your intentions and knowing that ultimately, like you're not in this for yourself, you're not in this for social clout, um, you're in this because you take a job very seriously and believe in uh, in the good of it. Like I feel like my job is not necessarily to deliver dopamine hits to people via social media. Uh, it's to be someone who looks at this sport that's being played right now and takes a job as historian very seriously. And I know that, you know, the game needs people who can essentially memorialize what's going on at that particular moment. And that's what I'm always trying to do. I mean, you know, I, like I'm on TV now and uh, I tweet plenty, but uh, at my, uh, like in my soul, I will always be a writer. And that's the part of the job that that I derive the most enjoyment from. It's just writing things that hopefully give you a sense of where the game is right now and have some context and have some history. And in the fact that I've been doing this now 21 years, like I've seen a fair bit and and I like to try and, you know, share that wisdom with the, the people who care to learn it. Jeff, first of all, really appreciate you joining the show, giving us some time kind of in that same vein. Is there a particular, whether it's a tweet or even an article that you've written to give more context, is there one specific instance, whether it's just general baseball or even for Orioles here, where you remember where you were, what happened, the aftermath? Is, is there one particular memorable one for you that you'll like never forget where you were and what happened with it? Yeah, was it Corbett Birds getting traded to Baltimore? <laughs> or was it, you know, I remember where I was. It was uh, right here. See, that's so cool to me. Like, I'm so lucky that I get to do this job because I, I get like, I get associated with people's good feelings. Like, think about how rare that is yeah. when what you do for a living is directly tied to people feeling really good about themselves. Um, let's see. There was one. Um, I wasn't breaking a lot of news back when I did this, but I was uh, I was living in an apartment. My, my wife and I had bought a house that we were redoing. She was pregnant. Our other son was like three at that point. And I heard that you Darvish was going to the Rangers and proceeded to have about a three hour negotiation with the second source who wouldn't confirm it for me, like would do everything but confirm it and wouldn't confirm it. Finally, I got confirmation on it, was able to send it there. And that was a good feeling. The, the best one, though. So the lockout ends. Of course, it ends when I'm down at Disney World with my kids. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> Yep. And like everything there, there was a, there were a bunch of trades this day. I think it was the day um, that Jesse Winker got traded. I remember I was walk. we were at Universal that day and I was walking toward the exit after standing online for, for way too long and got the Winker news and tweeted that. But I was, I still have a picture. Let me see if I can, if I can find it. I have a picture of where I was when I broke the Maddles trade. Oh. I was standing in line waiting to go on this ride that like shoots you up 200 feet in the air. And I, I was just, I was waiting and, and it was this ride where like the line was all full of like neon shit and it was all these <laughs> bright colors and it felt like I was going to have a seizure. Like I, uh, <laughs> I just remember standing there like, this is, this is my life. This is a, a very weird thing to have and a weird place to be, but uh, you know what? I get to to break a story standing online. Uh, here we go. Was it one of those rides there? There. Oh my goodness. Okay. Oh. So. <laughs> oh, so that's real. Wait, that's, that's a Star Trek or, or the uh, Star Wars ride? Maybe. No, he's at Universal. Oh, Universal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe it was the, the Incredible Hulk one or something. I don't know. No, just, it was the. Uh, it, it was the one where you like sit there with your legs dangling out, and they wait, say something like, that shoots you up in the air. Yes, yeah. yes, that one. Do you like that shit, Jeff? Because I, I, that thing I, that with height scares the hell out of me yeah. going up that high. Do I like it? No. Um, 
do I like it better than standing in line for three hours for something? Yeah. Yes, I absolutely yeah. do. Cause Damn every right line do. that day was ridiculous. And I, it was one of those where I was like, Hey guys, you want to go on this one? <laughs> and they're like, no, not really. I was like, but it's awesome. Cause it shoots you up in the air. And I like, I was selling hard because I just, you know, standing in line for three sucks. hours for anything sucks. Standing in line with two kids for three hours sucks way harder. Oh, it's yeah. way, 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 way worse. I'll live vicariously through you on that. Uh, and <laughs> so we got two questions, Orioles related, then we'll get you out of here. Cause it's kind of, I guess these aren't kids anymore, but they're prospects. Yeah. And I think uh, things have been uh, kind of nutty, at least in AAA or specifically Norfolk, if I'm mistaken, Zach. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jeff. I would say we talked about the UCL and elbow issues are probably a pitcher's worst nightmare right now, but AAA pitcher's worst nightmare, I would think, is going against the Norfolk Tides at the moment. Hold uh, on. Can I just seen... interrupt for a second? Yeah. How does Heston Kerstad have 25 RBIs in nine games? <laughs> well, well, we have, well, we have him on after you. So yeah, we can ask him how the hell he's coming, yeah, he's coming yeah, can, you please ask, can you please ask him that question? I understand he had like 10 in one game. Like, I yeah. get that. But that's still 15 and eight games. Like, that's still an <laughs> absurd thing. So have, have you seen, one, a squad with this many top prospects, one through five, and then a team performing this well where – they scored like 19 runs, and then the next game they're like, "Okay, actually, we're going to score 26 this time." Like, there's just they just keep upping it. Yeah, somebody texted me a couple of days ago, a, a longtime evaluator, that this is the best minor league team I've ever seen. Um, I don't know if they have the pitching necessarily to be called yeah. that, but I think you can suggest that they're the best minor league offense. And I'm sure in history there have been great teams that. I don't necessarily know about, but just in terms of a collection of prospects, you don't very often see, you know, four top hundred guys and, and, you know, Connor Norby is sort of like borderline for some guys, but mm -hmm. um, holidays, number one for everyone right now, yeah. Kobe Mayo for some people is as good as like top 10. And I think universally is a top 25 and Kirstad's not far behind. So yeah, the, you you don't, especially like at the upper levels, you know, guys of that ilk quite often get bumped from double A just straight to the big leagues. They they skip triple A. So seeing that many big league ready guys at triple A, um, it's awesome. Like I think I, that's I, 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 I want to go don't... to Norfolk and watch them for a, a weekend just to just to see what it's like in person. You know, the greatest show in baseball. It's like they are so much better than every other triple a team um it, it's a bigger gap than anything you see in the big leagues yeah i think that's what's crazy is like you said it's not okay this is single a ball where these guys are just going nuts. this is one level below the majors that they have all these guys just having unreal starts yeah and i think that that brings up the, a really great follow-up question and 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 Jeff, again, uh, thanks for for coming on to the show. It's a really, real, real great pleasure to meet you. I've been a fan of you for so long. Um, I, I the, a lot, lot of fans in 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 Birdland are, are really kind of upset that some of these guys aren't playing big league ball right now, uh, especially the Jackson Holidays of the world. Jackson Holidays <laughs> specifically. <laughs> I, I, I like I. I understand the frustration. I'm so, but, I'm so sorry that your 101 win team isn't better. I like thank, that's what thank I'm saying. You. There it we, is. Thank you. Yes. There it is. Yeah, like we've been in such poverty for so mm. long, and then like you know now we're just uh, we're in a surplus of Juggernaut. talent, and now all of a sudden people are pissed about it. The thing he, of it well, is, he, so so here's the thing: if you're going to break with your 26 best players on opening day, they're right. Jackson Holiday is one of the 26 best players in the Orioles organization. There's a good argument to be made that Kobe Mayo is one of the 26 best players in the organization. Yeah. There's a good argument to be made that Heston Kerstad is one of the best 26 players in the organization. That's fair. Like, I get why they want to bring the absolute best players to the big leagues right now to start off. But you also need to understand that when you have solid quality big leaguers there already there is an advantage to keeping guys down and leveraging the rules as best you can to make sure that this window is extended even more and i'm sorry but jackson holiday is a scott boris client he's not going to be signing an extension that's not going to happen 
So if you can get an extra year out of him, if you can leverage those rules to get one more season out of him at the back end when he's still in his prime, I don't like it. I wish it weren't that way, but the rules are the rules and the yeah. Orioles have done a very good job of using the rules in their favor in recent years. And it's not that Michael Elias and Sig all like are beyond question. They're not, of course. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to do things that are wrong. And if the Orioles wind up losing the division and ending up in a wild card series because of one game in the standings, then they're going to look dumb for not having brought Holiday up at the beginning of the season. I just think it's too early to sit here and say, whether that effect is going to demonstrably change what things would have looked like otherwise. And, and here's the thing. There is an argument for both sides. I just don't want Orioles fans who understandably want these players in the big leagues right now to look past the organizational advantages that come from putting them down. It was, sucks in the moment, but long term, it may be what's best for them. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. We just had Buster only on here last week and, and speaking to this and he, he kind of takes the side of like, you know, this, the he'll, he, he called, he called, called it uh, service time manipulation, but like at the same time, oh, like he, he spoke to how it can negatively impact how players feel about the organization if they do that. So I understand what you're saying. And I think from a business standpoint, it makes a ton of sense from the, from the front office but is there some truth to that too? Do you think that there's some some players that that may may uh, hold a grudge when it comes to something like that? Yes, but in the end, money talks. Money talks. That's <laughs> it, Jeff. If they if they give him they give Jackson Holiday five hundred million dollars. Yeah, he's not. They will give forget him about what they care. gave to him when he was twenty years old. <laughs> <laughs> You're damn right. And that, that that's the part of it. This is the part. And it's a great question, though, Brad, with because it is a business at the end of the day. Yeah. And people can say all the, the all of a sudden, oh, things can be broken. Well, that's why I said, like we're in Baltimore here, Jeff, and the Baltimore Ravens, and everyone's saying Lamar Jackson's out of here. He wants to trade. Oh, here, Lamar. Here's two hundred and fifty million dollars. Yeah. Okay, Baltimore. Let's ride. Like that's just how it works. He, I mean, sports. here's like here's here's how I look at it. The most important thing is is Jackson Holiday up by the end of September so he can play when the playoffs come around. Yep. And 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 the thing is, like, all that matters right now is that you get a lottery ticket. Like we we saw last October, the Arizona Diamondbacks had 84 wins. They were 16 games behind the Los Angeles Dodgers in the National League West, and they swept them out of the playoffs and rode it all the way to the World Series. They were the third team in three years to have the worst record among playoff teams in its league and go all the way to the world. Series. Like, you know, you just, you don't know what's going to happen in October. And so the way that baseball's playoff structure is set up at this point, and, and this is like, I don't like that this is the case, but it's, it's the reality. It's what they're dealing with. Um, you just have to play to be good enough in the regular season. You don't yeah, have to play to win that. You don't have to play to like, is anyone going to sit there and celebrate the 2023 Baltimore Orioles American League East title? Yeah, it was nice. And you can, you can hang like a little bitty banner for it, but the big banner is the one that counts. And if Jackson holiday is up by the end of the season, he's going to be trying to help you win that as opposed to the first, you know, month, two months of the season. Yeah, I don't think anyone in Texas was also realizing that the Rangers almost missed the playoffs and had the battle to make it, always going to win the division, and then all of a sudden they sneak in, win 11 straight on the road en route to yep. the World Series. I think everyone in Texas is pretty damn happy. I'm right there with you, Jeff. I think the ultimate goal, be up at the right time, and actually we'll have a chance maybe to talk to some other people involved with the holidays in the, in the future. And I, we love your perspective on this. Guys, any other thing before we – let Jeff get ready and plan his next trip down to Universal or, yeah, or to Disney or whatever <laughs> he's doing next. No, Jeff, this is awesome. Was there ever a point where, where you were in that line where you're like, okay, I might have to fire this tweet off on the ride? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good, yes, actually. Yes. Now that, now, you know, I, I hadn't thought back on that, but I remember I had it loaded in my drafts. Like, I, that's one thing I would do. I'll put things in the draft. <laughs> because I was not going to be typing going up 70 miles an hour into the air, but it was getting like, like 
very close to the front of the line where I worried I was going to get the go ahead when I was getting shot up in the air. Like and I did not want to have my phone in my hand <laughs> because, I'm so, you know, I, I don't know what is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Like, yeah. I have no idea what it's going to be like. But if I broke my phone because I was waiting to put it out there. Uh, that, that would have sucked. And, and way, let, me, let okay. me just let me just add one little addendum to the holiday point. The best argument is, uh, you know, when you win Rookie of the Year now, and you're up at the beginning of the season, you get an extra draft pick. Yeah. And you know, the draft pick last year turned into Enrique Bradfield, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and the draft pick this year, we'll see who it turns into. But that extra draft pick, you know, that's how you keep. Uh, you keep loading up the farm system and that is a, uh, you know, the reason that the O's are where they are right now is because they have done an incredible job of drafting and developing. And so the marginal value of that extra draft pick, maybe it is worth it, uh, for what you get on the front end in addition to the production. Well, I, I, you're exactly right. It finally, and I think people understand this now, the Orioles were ahead of schedule last year. Now yeah. the everything's expedited because everyone's going, well, wait a minute, they, they should win right now. Okay, well, they're still trying to figure out who they have. And to make this yeah. machine keep going, you got to keep bringing guys in. And then you figure out at the right point when you want to move on. I tell people, Jeff, that the reason why the Orioles held on for so long, too, with guys like Joey Ortiz or Jordan Westberg is, quite frankly, they go, we haven't had enough time to decide who we were going to keep. Right. And then they said, right. we're going to keep Jordan Westberg. They love Westy. I'm a big Westy guy. And they go, okay, we're ready to part with this for what we want. And I think we're going to see more of that down the stretch. So maybe, if you don't mind, down the stretch, as the Orioles, as uh, everyone calms down after the first week, team's still over 500, and the team, I think, will be right in the race, just like I believe you the same, believe the same thing. We can have you on to talk about, realistically, what can happen with the Baltimore Orioles. And, and maybe you can drop a pass and bomb that will make everyone happy in Baltimore again <laughs> real soon. But Jeff, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk soon. Pleasure's mine, boys. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, thank Jeff, you, Jeff. You, Jeff. That was awesome. That was awesome. I can't yeah. believe that that Jeff the the the. The, well, to be able to have the phone and the drafts ready, Zach, you can relate to that because yes. you have about a million drafts yeah. set up. God, the time. That's the draft <laughs> that was guy. like a one of us moment. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> I've never felt so connected to Jeff Passon in, in that moment when he was like, "Yeah, I have a bunch of drafts." I was like, "Could you not see him like <laughs> in the air, like, like, oh yeah, crazy face, like, oh, just like tweet, boom." It's like Olsen got traded. I know he said uh, he was worried about the phone breaking. I think he would have been okay with it as long as he saw tweet send. If yes, like it exactly. tweets send and then phone like, breaks, I think it's it's a wash at that point. It, <laughs> it happened. Your phone and it's just like okay, sent, boom, we're good. Hits the yeah. ground, money. Well, see the issue. With, what if it was like you know he was trying to hit send but he couldn't hit it because you know he's moving all over the place Ooh. and then the phone flies out of his hand and like it's literally there in the drafts and then I don't know the falls in so some many lake things. or something. Yeah, right? What what if something accidentally got typed then and then it, the, yeah. the phone smacks and. Yeah shatters and it's like what is breaking news uh the athletics are sending and then it just oh, it's gibberish and they're like what that, the hell happened the judge um, that's what but I, then there's the, no way to tell anyone because the phone is broken really, so it's just that tweet forever until yeah. he gets a new phone i wonder how like far in advance that he knows because he talked about and it's a really cool like to, to be able to build those relationships in this business and to know like okay i have a source that's reliable but I need to go through that source to confirm. And he says he goes through multiple sources to go through that to make sure he covers his tracks. But I wonder like how far in advance he potentially like knew about a Corbin Burns trade or he knows about these big trades where he's just not able to fire it off at this point in time. Because obviously in the reporting business, you want to be first, but you also want to be correct. You don't want to mess anything up or say the wrong thing because that'll come back to bite you in the ass. Yeah, but well. he does such a good job of like, covering his tracks but that, that i'm curious to know like how far in advance with some of these things like he knows he might know for weeks he might yeah, know for months. i, I think we, he might have inklings and you know, just yeah. from what i know about at least in this industry they might get inklings that people are interested for a while yeah. but they don't know the levels of or, or when or yeah. if things could happen and that's why he's not like the other reporters that's, that's gonna tease oh i'm hearing reports yep yeah 
It's yeah. he's only going to report it if there's extreme validity behind it. And that's We're why saying, when we brought up the arson judge, what's up? No, I'm saying, and they're texting him. Like they, yes. the sources are texting him. He's not proud. Like, you know, it's crazy. Well, and that's why every time anything happens, we're like, oh, you see a news, like rumor sources, so-and-so is getting moved or traded. You're like, but did Jeff tweet it out? Yeah, yes. it's not real until passing yes. tweets. But yes, yes, yes. That would have been a, a really great, great question to ask uh, Jeff uh, Rocco. And because I think that we don't do, we haven't done a good enough job of explaining some of our guests, especially those who are professional media guys, uh, that Rocco is a professional media guy. <laughs> and so like that would have been something to like actually uh bring up to jeff just because like you know the, the tools of the trade uh type of type of conversation i'm sure he probably would have appreciated Dude, that i wanted to bring up the corbin burns trade so bad because like you guys talked about like where were you i remember yeah. where i was because i think we were doing a stream and then we just finished like, yeah we just <laughs> yeah. dropped yeah. it and i was like i, right, I had broken it and it was like it was like at six or seven o'clock that he put yep. it out Yep. I first of all wanted to thank him for waiting until after our 550 show ended because it wasn't like crazy, like, oh my God, I have to scramble to get this on. But that was all, actually what happened. Yeah, it was. Well, no, I had to, I had to scramble to get <laughs> He's talking about the, Fox, the Fox. Yeah, his, his own thing. Yeah. 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 I will. I will never. I'll give. I'll give Zach a quick shout out. I've never seen him so locked in when that trade dropped. He <laughs> he was literally pacing up and down the studio. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. sure, just yeah, like Zach's a nervous pacer. mega He's creating tough, yeah. drafts for whatever the compensation was. Who's getting trade? And I know Ryan oh, was. Yeah. You know, he, he kept asking. You know, who who's in the deal? Because we didn't know for like 15 or 20 minutes who was, was in the deal. I think I was clipping something up. Yeah, and we had just finished. Yeah, yeah, I think we all had exited out of the stream and everything. I and, I specifically remember somebody, one of us, saying, "Oh, Passon tweeted it, so it's legit." I specifically remember that happening. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just remember Kevin broke it in just the most nonchalant yeah. way ever. <laughs> we're sitting true. here, and he just goes, "The Orioles, oh, got it, yeah. Orioles just got Corbin Burns." And we're like, <laughs> "What?" And he's like, "Yeah, Jeff Passon just tweeted it." Yeah, I was, like, I was like getting up, like, "Put the most Kevin I'm like, the Orioles just got Corbin Burns." Like, okay. And then Kevin's like, "Maybe we should go live again." Maybe, maybe we oh should go live again. It, it uh, that was real. one of our better live streams too. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, talk about Zach. Zach being excited, like that was probably the horniest I've ever seen. Zach was trying to send <laughs> off that amount of tweets. Oh uh, yeah, how many, how, many push -up fire. how many push ups did you do that night? Like, uh, so, I, I probably could have done a million right yeah. here. Wow, the way that the save adrenaline it. was going. Boom. No, save it. Let's. You can cap it at seventy two. But you were excited. You were horned up for it. Hey guys, we appreciate that you guys are tuning in. Jeff Passam was just on with us. So hit that like and subscribe if you're new to the channel. Ryan Ripkin Show, do it every Mondays and Thursdays, occasionally on Sundays. Or if something crazy happens, we will go live like we just heard this story with Corbin Burns. That's just what we do. And if you're following us on X, make sure you – or if you're not, make sure you're following us on X. At We got people around. I'm at Ryan Ripkin. You got Own the Chaos. You got at Chaos Striker 34 for Kev. At Zach Bollinger 18 and at Rocco DeSangro. Gosh, it's a lot to say. But we got we, – I was going to do a little bit of a breakdown because – uh, Jeff came on a little bit longer, which I appreciated, uh, and, and really started to talk a little bit more about the game and sports and all that. So we'll 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 save the next breakdown in a minute. Um, but yeah, exciting time so far here in Baltimore, to say the least, and exciting time as far as when you're able to have people baseball uh, historians, and that's something that Jeff did recognize him saying he's a historian. So the one player, Tommy Hinzo, again, that might be a part of the Ryan Ripken show. Uh, trivia question oh when the time God. comes yeah for sure like that story was really cool yeah. we've heard a lot of other stories like you know and not to take anything away from what buster only uh shared with us last week about the whole laptop situation but like that story has been told before yeah. so something like that was really cool it it, it really was the ironic the ironic thing with the buster posey story was ken rosenthal's buster last only yeah buster only that. story I don't know. What he I, what keeps referring to only as Posey. <laughs> was Buster Posey like your favorite player or something? I, I, I'll be honest. I fucking love Buster Posey. I thought he was a stud. I thought he was great. Well, yeah. There's a big difference between Buster Posey and Buster only. I'll be honest. There's a drastic <laughs> difference. But the story was that Ken Rosenthal it had his laptop. And yeah. ironically, Ken wrote a story that my dad should end the streak. And then I think later that day or that week, who gets a foul ball right to his laptop? Ken Rosenthal. Who hit the foul ball? Cal Ripken Jr. Yeah. I'm just saying. That's just kind of how it works. All right. Um, so before then, I guess we should move on, I guess, because we got our 
our next guest in here. Uh, he's also ask him the poll question. We should ask him the poll question then. What is, oh, do you want to, what is the poll question? <laughs> the poll question <laughs> actually has gotten a lot of engagement. One of my more engaged, and I'm surprised that this one has gotten as much as it has, but the greatest decade for comedy movies is. Oh, gosh. Well, he might have to, may, maybe if he's thinking he can ruminate, or is it ruminate the right word? Or Dude, no, think? Bring, him, bring him on, Rick. Okay. Well, well <laughs> he, he currently, currently, Rocco, Rocco, great to see you in studio. You're a good kid, but currently he's the reigning AAA player of the week. Yeah. Former uh, first round draft pick of the Baltimore Orioles and a guy that tr really hates the Charlotte Knights, Mr. Heston Kirsten. <laughs> Let's bring Heston on in here. Oh, there he is. Heston, what's going on? How you doing? Not too much. How y'all doing? We're, we're doing all right. We're hanging in there. It's the off day, right? It's the six game schedules. I'm, I'm still remembering that correctly. Yep. Yeah. Monday, you know, you either travel or, you know, today we traveled last night. So, you know, get situated for the week and everything like that. So, yeah. Well, before we get into some baseball talk, I don't know if you heard the question. So, the polls, best decade of comedy. Was that the question, Brad? Yeah. Be best 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s was the, the option. Do you, do you have a, I know it's putting you on the spot. Do you have a certain decade that you think is funnier than the others? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm young. So, I'm going, I'm going with the 2000s, the Step Brothers. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, that's all that's right. Nice. There we the go. Hangover, all those. That's, if I'm turned into a comedy movie, it's probably about like 2008 to 2012. That's probably prime time comedy. Hell yeah. Honestly, that's like the last time there was any good comedies, in my opinion. I, yeah. The, the comedy era has just has died, mm -hmm. at least at least up until, I don't know, last five, seven years. But yeah, that, that that's a good 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 answer, Heston. I appreciate that. That right. we're we're off to a good start then. Yeah, nice. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're off to a good start. Well, actually, you know, and, before, and I know, obviously, we got to talk a lot of baseball. And the question that everyone's really, you know, wondering. Well, should we save that, Rocco? Do you want to save that one? What's that? Well, what was it's it's not baseball related, is it? No, but it's well, Ar it's Arkansas related. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, the real question. Yeah, we're asking them now. We are asking. Okay. Them. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah. yeah. Talk about H Heston should be in the big leagues. No, Heston, what should be the real question is, what do you think about John Calipari going to Arkansas? That's what everyone really wants to know. Oh, that's that's a huge hire. Like for Arkansas to be able to get him away from Kentucky was huge. And also nobody had it on their radar. I, I was keeping up with it after Musselman. They knew he's leaving. He got the job at USC and it was on nobody's list anywhere and then just boom we we yeah. land him for a five-year deal which was huge but also um the ad there hunter gerchuk he's really good he was there while i was in school i actually got to like know him because he tries to be around the sports the athletes and all that and he is really good at what he does so it's not shocking at all that he was able to go snag a coach from a blue chip school blue chip basketball program and bring him into the arkansas so you know hopefully he can take the arkansas basketball program and turn it into an absolute powerhouse hell yeah hell yeah it is a big one and there. uh one more what thing yeah uh, what you got <laughs> he actually got ejected when i was in college at one of the games when <laughs> arkansas was playing kentucky that was probably the loudest i'd ever heard like uh, that basketball arena get was when he got thrown out. Uh, I don't know what year that was, but he got ejected and it was absolute madhouse after that happened. Yeah. Hell yeah. Did, did Arkansas win that game though? Did the Razorbacks? Uh, the they ended up, it was like one of those came down to like the last three minutes. I'm pretty sure they lost it by like ah. Kentucky got hot, started landing some threes or whatever. So he hate, hate those Wildcats, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Freaking Kentucky, man. Um, on another note, because now we'll talk a little bit of baseball. So first off, I want people to know this, at least when I got a chance to meet you and you know this is when you started off, it was in the alternate sites so and we're coming out of COVID. It was 2021. And you had just signed with the Orioles, but then you were dealing with your heart condition. And when I tell people the situation, I remember, first off, you came in, gave a firm handshake, introduced yourself. And I'm like, wow, that's actually a good grip. But secondly, <laughs> but sec fuck? no, okay. Do, do you, do people not value yeah. giving a good handshake? It, it, it's a lost art. It's a lost art is thank, what I'll say. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Kevin. <laughs> thank you. You guys, I'm trying to give the man a compliment. He's got great manners. But the thing that I want people to know is that initially, I remember you with D walk Heston, you were just were yeah. walking, walking the track of the outfield. That was your workout at the time. And I remember 
people saying, well, is it going to work out for him? And I remember I watched all your highlights. I watched all your tape. And then I'm just like, dude, he just needs to, to get right, just get healthy. And when he's healthy, the sky's the limit. And now personally, if we're talking about current time, uh, what the hell happened down in Charlotte with with the Charlotte Knights down there? Because I don't, I don't think, not even in any level, I've ever seen somebody um, hate a baseball team more or the fact that you have 25 ribbies, dude. Yeah, I was going to say, I literally, Friday night, I literally watched him hit that the top of the first home run on Friday into Bearden Park. And I don't know if I've ever seen that. I don't know if I've ever seen that. That was crazy. So I guess yeah. you're feeling pretty good. Yeah, no, definitely off to a good start this spring or this this season. So, you know, felt good all week. Definitely just seeing the ball well and anytime it's over the plate, not missing it. And, you know, just trying to keep it rolling at this point. It's it's one of those things. It's the game's a lot of fun when you're able to go out there and have that much success early on. But also I'm trying to learn from what I did last week as much as I can because it's it's not just luck or it's not just, oh, it's your time. It's There's something in there that causes that to happen. So making sure I learn from it, remember it, and carry that on as the season goes on. Yeah, you got the right mindset with it for sure. I think Zach has some other questions related to it. Yeah, uh, first, Heston, thank you for saying that as a fellow, I'm the young guy of the uh, show, so <laughs> whenever I get called out for not knowing the like 90s, early 80s, 70s movies, so I appreciate you for showing the 2000s some love. <laughs> Second off, problem. have you have you ever hit had 10 RBIs in a game, or is that your is that your most for a game at any level? Oh, uh, one one hundred percent. That's the first time I've ever had 10 RBIs. I don't even know the most I've ever had in a game, but it's for sure never had double digits and I didn't even know I had 10 RB, RBIs until I got back in the locker room and a couple of the guys were like dude what the heck like that's the craziest like 10 RBIs in a game and I was like oh I had 10 shoot like dang I didn't even know that just because like we were scoring so much that game I wasn't even keeping up with it so I, I was counting I was counting on my my fingers after the game in the locker room just to double check the guys were right and they were <laughs> <laughs> What's going through, like, not only your head, but everyone in the dugout, when you guys are putting up 26 runs and 29 hits, is it just everyone is like, I want to be up next? Is it just everyone wants a shot? Yeah, and honestly, it's been the whole first nine games we've played, It's it's been an absolute offensive powerhouse in our lineup. It's been impressive. Like, every guy in front of you seems like they're, getting on base every at bat and you know when you're putting up that many runs everybody's fighting at the bat rack you know we all want our abs we all we all want to drive each other in and you know it's it's honestly a lot of fun for all of us you know we work really hard together and to see a bunch of your teammates and the guys hitting in front of you and behind you have success and such a tough sport you know we just we feed off each other it's a group of really talented players that are just out there having fun I love that. Rock, go ahead. I think you got you got a few yeah. thoughts here. Heston, what's going on? Man? Thanks for joining the show. Uh, I don't know if you remember this specific moment from last year because a lot happened in the clubhouse after the game. But when you guys clinched that postseason berth, when you were in there, I actually got to interview you. And uh, Austin Hayes came in and, and kind of bombed the interview. And he, he dropped a line of his own. Zach has it queued up. But uh, number one, this moment, it's hilarious. Every time you hit a home run, one of us is tweeting this out. I But I have uh, a piggyback off of this video I want to ask you. So, oh, so. Thanks. He dropped sure. bombs, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was really funny uh, when he did that. Now it's – I mean, it pops up. I'm getting tagged in that all the time. So it's, oh, it's kind of a video. It's like he was like – kind of on the prowl the whole time you could see him in the back like all right i'm doing this i'm doing this i'm doing this and then he pops up and does it so obviously your teammates they're like this guy hits bombs this fan base feels the same way to you when you're swinging do you ever surprise yourself with how far you can hit a baseball sometime does does that ever pop into your head or are you just kind of taking it one at bat and bat at a time because man it's impressive how far you can hit a baseball and there's Fans here that, that think you could be the first guy to hit the warehouse in the air. Uh, you know, for sure, from time to time. Like, I know what I'm capable of, but then also 
there's times in a game where you may hit a pitch a certain way where you never have. Like this past weekend, one of my homers was off a cutter, a ball in, mm-hmm. and I'm not known for pulling the ball down the line or I'm not known for hammering the inside pitch. I live kind of over in the middle of the plate, everything like that. So hitting a ball like that's kind of like, okay, wow, like that's another part of the plate that I'm covering better than I normally do. So from time to time, I definitely, you know, see something myself that I haven't saw before or mm-hmm. something I've been working on for a long time that shows up. And it's like, okay, sweet. Like that's starting to show up in my game. Kind of, you know, starting to feel better with certain parts. But for the most part, you know, I've, you know, you see yourself hit B, P or all the work you put in. So, you know, there's not too much shock and awe for yourself as a player, you know, because you know what you're capable of. But from time to time, you're still like, okay, shoot, that's that's pretty sweet. Or that's that's a little, that's a little different than other times. Yeah, you... um your game uh, that's the thing for you you use the whole field and you actually are super good at keeping the ball up the middle your power to left center and left is ridiculous i think you had three of the home runs in charlotte were to left or left center if i'm not mistaken um and then it's kind of like the accidents are the ones that are inside not that you can't it's just you just stay through the baseball so well and actually zach lowther was at the game in in uh florida heston he's that or not in florida in charlotte and zach just oh. tuning in right now because Heston, I tried to stay at the game on Friday, but it was cold and you made it uh, through three and a half. You made it uh, three innings in an hour and a half. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it was freezing. Oh, that's awesome. Man, it's, it's been a while since I saw Zach, but he, he's, a, he's a good dude. That's, yeah, that's so, awesome. So Zach, was, Zach and I uh, were together for a lot of years, but uh, t- we started together in 17, but he actually texted me about that. He goes, they just keep hitting the baseball. And like when you're not playing too, that's I think the most impressive. Yeah. You guys are doing it in the in the elements that are not fun. So it will avoid yep. what's going on. I think that that's what's what's been really uh, exciting to see. So I can't wait to see what it does when it turns up. A few more questions for you, but I think Kevin has something to even on. Sure. You talked about kind of like progression, Kevin. Is that where you're yeah, going with yeah. this? So Heston, first of all, thanks for taking the time and joining us. But kind of piggybacking off what you were saying about your progression and how you know you you're not known for doing this or that. But over the course of, of your career so far, is there anything that you kind of look back on maybe what you were doing a year ago or a couple of years ago, maybe like a, a mechanical tweak, something in your stance where today you look back on that and you say, man, I have no idea what I was doing here. But, you know, whether it was coaches or just advice, you, you kind of have tweaked that in your game today. Uh, I would say year over year, uh, pretty similar to where I was last year at this time. But I would say over the past year, there's been times where maybe I, you know, something creeps up on you and you got to make an adjustment or make a fix. Like one thing for me is I like to stay narrow and stand up tall in the box. And from time to time, I kind of got to monitor my starting point with my stance. Sometimes I'll get a little bit wider. And then once I get wider, I can't really hold my hinge in my back leg or I'll start overstriding and getting on my front side and maybe collapsing on my front leg and leaking energy out of my front side. So for me, that's probably the main thing that I maintain or keep an eye on throughout the whole season is just my starting point with my stance. If I'm in a good starting point with my hands and the width of my stance, then it's like everything from there normally falls into place for myself. Yeah, I love your little whatever. I know it's like if you consider it a leg kick or hitch that you have with it and people mm-hmm. go, looks, your balance that you get to it every time is so damn good. Uh, and it's really fun to watch. I don't, I, you know, I don't want you to overthink it. I want you to keep progressing. Kevin yeah. what does too. But don't <laughs> don't you start overanalyzing because Kevin started asking you about a thought. You keep <laughs> no. riding. You keep, keep going. Riding, keep going. Keep riding that wave. <laughs> uh, so la- last couple things, we'll wrap up. You know, one thing, obviously, you guys got a lot of talent, and I know you were friends with a lot of guys on on the big league team, and with the guys you're with, that's what makes it easier to go have success. But how do you continue to block things out? You know, I, and I, I know and I fully believe you're ready and capable to go up, right? But you have to it's – the, it's the business of it. How do you just remind yourself to kind of stay in that moment um, the best that you can? Because all you can do right now is continue to terrorize pitchers and continue to work and put your best foot forward, but – uh, whatever you're doing, 
Um, please, please don't change anything. But is that how do you how do you block out the excess noise? Yeah, for sure. You know, there's definitely a little bit of noise like that. But the thing, uh, like I always remind myself, is we all have our own journey, our own path. And yes, there's maybe people that think you should be in the big leagues right now or you know i am ready to play in the big leagues right now and stuff like that but there's also a timing whether it's having enough of bats in the big leagues or having a position available or things like that the roster fluidity of veterans and guys like that and you know even there's guys playing in a spot in front of you that's that's their spot and it you know it's got to open up but you know it, that's the benefit of playing on a really good baseball team. You know, if the Orioles weren't so stacked and we didn't have all this stacked talent down in AAA, the big league team wouldn't be chasing the things that it's chasing this year with a postseason and a World Series and coming off 100 wins. So it's a double-edged sword to where that's what's going to make the team so good in the long run. And honestly, it'll make it a lot more fun because playing for a winning team's you know, that's what you want to do. You want to show up to the park every day and chase something. And that chases the postseason and World Series eventually. And yeah. that's just part of it for me. You know, I just stay focused where my feet are, you know, every day. I'm thankful that I get to go out and play baseball, whether that's in AAA. That's awesome. Let's go out there. Let's put on a show. Let's get better as a player. And, you know, we all want to be in the big leagues. It's not that we're, you know, totally content with, being a triple A baseball player, but you know, you got to count your blessings and also just wait for your turn and also use the opportunities I have in triple A. So when my turn comes in the big leagues that I'm ready for it and ready to help in any way I can for the team. Yeah. You got the right mindset. And also it is better to play when you're winning and not when you're losing at any level. And you got to taste that. I'm sorry I had the interview with Rocco last year about the moment, <laughs> but 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 that's what it's all about. It's all about popping champagne and, and and doing something and trying to chase a dream. And for you, the dream is to win a World Series, and that's what the yep. Orioles' dream is. I know when you're at Arkansas, that was the dream as well. They play; they're off to a hot start. The baseball team. Yeah. Uh, we we I know you probably are following that very closely. So mm -hmm. are they are they gonna well you're probably biased, yes. Hogs yeah. are winning this year. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little biased, but uh <laughs> I think they have a really good shot at winning it this year. Uh the pitching staff's the best I've ever saw there. They I mean, all y'all probably heard the stuff about Hagen Smith. I mean, yeah. he's averaging two punch outs and in innings, like it's crazy. Which he's is nasty. Unreal. Which is just ridiculous from the left side. I got the I trained back there in the off season, so I got to see him throw his bullpens and everything while I'd be training. He would be around or they'd be running practice. And I'm like, like, that's, that's a legit arm. Like he's, he was throwing his bullpens like at 96, like in the middle of the off season with no adrenaline or anything. And then he comes out and he's 96 to 99 with two great off speed pitches from the left side. It's like, all right, like he's, he's, he's having a good year. He's going to, you're, you're, you're going to see him down the road for sure. He's going to have a good career in baseball. That's that's for sure. I think he will. I think Arkansas has done a pretty good job, I think, of, of uh, dishing out some talented players. You know, and, yep. and you you got the right mindset. I know there's no doubt your your moment's going to come to Baltimore, and, and it already has. But when you are, let, let us know anything I can help you with. In the meantime, give Buck Britton a hug. Give Adam a hug there for me as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Adam's the man. Adam's the man. Adam, for those that don't know, is the clubhouse manager there in AAA. When I'm saying the guy, the guy. You guys you guys talk about Rip After Dark. That's a guy you need <laughs> on for Rip After Dark. Yeah. Um, no, hey, Adam would be a good guy to have on. He's Ooh. He's been around. A lot of oh. good stories. And also, I would add Adam to the list of uh, AAA talent that uh, – that uh, should soon be in the big leagues for sure. Yeah, damn right. He, he needs he needs a big league clubby job too. Damn right he <laughs> should. We talk about it quite a bit actually. But I said if if he's down there, hopefully hopefully you're up here this year in like the next week, you know. And he's <laughs> he's here next he's here next year because we know they can't change the contracts of that with with the club. Yeah. You can't go. Hey, we're calling up our clubhouse guy. Well, technically, I guess you could if they really need help. But you get what I mean. Yeah. Um, 
But I actually, uh, one of my best friends lives in Norfolk. So I told Adam I'd come down and bother him, make sure the clubhouse still looks good. But uh, Heston, really appreciate you coming on. Actually, one more thing, though, that Rocco, we have yep. to, because we have someone that's actually might be a bigger Arkansas fan than you. <laughs> yeah, this guy has followed your career religiously, Heston. He Die. is an Arkansas diehard. Um, he's a Baltimore Orioles fan as well, so he's got the best of both worlds, watching yep. you in AAA, watching you last season, and then watching you in college too. Uh, he asked us to ask you a question earlier, and it was about, you know, you get drafted, you come in as a highly touted draft pick to this club, and, and yep. then you, you suffer the setback with myocarditis what was there a point in time in your career where, you know, that point in time where you were like, damn, I might never swing a baseball bat again. Like what, what was that time like for you, man? Because since then you have just, I mean, it's incredible your journey. I think a lot of people love it. I think a lot of people appreciate it. Um, what you've been able to do over the course of your baseball career, but he wanted me to ask that question, not only because he's followed your career, he loves your career, but I believe he's got two family members that, that have, you know, the same condition mm -hmm. that they've dealt with over the course of their lives too. Yeah, no, for sure. It's definitely, you know, getting drafted and everything and then just get getting hit with that uh, to start my career. You know, it's definitely not the way you draw things up, but, you know, it gave me uh, a taste of life. And, you know, you're going to get hit with some of these things that, you know, are are tough to go through. But the only way to get through them is just, straight through them there's no path around it you can't really avoid it it's just an unfortunate situation to get through and that's probably where i started uh always there's still things to be thankful for like even when i was going through those times i was i was thankful for you know the team and the doctors that were providing me care and my family and everybody that was in my circle and just being able to get through that and everything like that it's you know, it's unfortunate anytime somebody has to go through any circumstances in life that, you know, sideline what they truly want to do. But, you know, there's a plan for everybody. And we wish we could all see that in plan from the first day. But that's part of the journey is you learn the things along the way. And I, I truly believe that that was a piece of my journey. And I think some of the things I learned going through those times of having those setbacks really brought me to where I'm at today and really helped me handle the day to day of what I do now. Because during those times, there was for, for sure some times I was always really hopeful and I knew I was, I was going to play ball again, even though even if it wasn't guaranteed, it was I was going to play baseball again. There wasn't there wasn't an option. There was one thing that was guaranteed and I was going to play ball again. So that was my mindset there there was no there was no not playing baseball for me i was going to find a way and to be able to get back out here and start playing i remember seeing ryan ripkin was my first time back and i started my rehab progression and Bowie with dewalk and you know it definitely was a struggle an uphill battle but you know once you turn the corner and it's all in the rear view you know it's it's just it's really refreshing that you're able to get through something like that and then be on the other side of it now. And, you know, anybody that has to go through anything remotely close. And unfortunately there's people who go through things that are even worse than that. You never hope that upon anyone, but just stay the course, try to stay hopeful. Even when times are tough, you know, there'll always be a better day ahead. That That's awesome. That's man. awesome. Well, the thing too, and, and I mean this, like you just saying that, and understand for people out there of your journey that you go through. I think some people, when they look at people get to successful heights and your journey's far from over on all this, which is awesome. Cause I, I think as a player, you're going to have a lot of success, but even outside of baseball, you're going to be successful. But sometimes people just need to hear that. And especially seeing with you, Heston, there's no doubt for me when I saw you there, I'm like, damn, when this guy <laughs> is ready to go, when this dude's ready to go, the world's going to see, and, and he's going to make a big impact and be able to live out your dream. So Sure. Uh, that's awesome. Last thing though, what, what is the, what is the war cry for Arkansas Rocco? Cause what, what do we, I, we I know what it is. Do you not it's know called, what it is? It's calling the hogs? Yeah. Call, so how Joe, do we, how do we Joe's call the hogs? In here, Heston, Joe Radke. Uh, I actually, yeah. Uh, I did, I had to call the hog, 
hogs on the bus last year for sure. So if y'all need to learn how to call the hogs, I got y'all here. So it's, <laughs> what is it? It's uh, <laughs> it's three parts. So you got ooh, ooh. pig suey, ooh. <laughs> Big suey, razor bats. Oh, and oh, wow. Th- that's the hog call right there. Once you get like, we had about like 12,000 at our baseball stadium. You get 12,000 fans calling that. It's pretty electric. And then the football stadium's like 80,000 doing the hog call. Oh, it's, my God. It's pretty sick. I would say Unreal. it's kind of like the, the O's with the national anthem. Yeah, to where yeah. the fan base has something to like pour energy into, like together, it's just it's like, sick. Like the uh, in the Viking Stadium where they do the skull yeah. chant. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's oh. gonna be the scariest oh, yeah. fucking thing. Ba- Bauman is obsessed over that. Yeah. Can't, every time I hear but Mike, Mike just will text me and just still text me skull. <laughs> <laughs> just, and I'm like, great, Mike, but that's sick. I want to see it. But uh, but honestly, okay, so we're gonna work on it. So it's in the future. It's woo, pig suey. Yeah. yeah, and then woo, pig, woo, suey, pig again. suey, and then, and then woo, woo, pig suey, razorbacks. Oh, okay, we're gonna yeah, have we'll get it down three right. times. It's three times, and then on the third time, it's razorback. Okay, so yeah. next time, next time I see you in person, Heston, I'm gonna have it down to a T. All right, perfect. All right. That's All how right. we welcome him back on the show when when Heston comes. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, we uh, just have to uh, scream it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God. God. Well, Heston, I appreciate you. Um, Oh God! You you made you made Joe's night, Heston. So God, appreciate nice. it. Um, Joe, don't <laughs> crash good. the car. Don't crash the car. But Heston, enjoy your off day. Give everyone my best in in Norfolk, and uh, we will talk soon. All right. For sure. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, guys. I'll hey. I'll catch up with y'all again for sure. Sounds good. Hey. Hey. Thanks, Thursday, Heston. Everybody. Thanks, Heston. Thanks, for having me, guys. Heston. Thanks, Heston. Hey. Hey. What a guy. That was yeah. awesome. Joe. What a guy. So. Joe yeah. lost his mind. I'm sure he's like probably screaming. <laughs> Joe is in the face. middle of of some rip after dark right now. Yeah, well, <laughs> that that or Joe <laughs> might be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dude, if he doesn't make like at least 400 in Red Bull sales tomorrow, <laughs> Joe, he's got to make. He got to make his new ringtone. Joe, I mean, Joe's mad at me now that I didn't know the hog call. Well, maybe I wanted to see it actually done, Joe. Maybe I need yeah. to see, it's so like I knew exactly. I actually, I mean, I think first I knew all, what it was. Rip, first of all, uh, Rip was a, was you were a gamecock, correct? I was a cock for a year. Yeah. And still do you, do you call the cocks or? No. <laughs> do you call the cocks? <laughs> 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 Can we call the? I get it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> It's a real welcome question. back, Kevin. Is, is, welcome is, is, back. Is there not a cheer that you worst, did? Let me just answer. Is, so yes, the answer is yes. Oh, Rip, that was Rip, so Rip knows how to call the Cox. That was okay, so innocent right. too, uh, Kevin. And it was oh just, no! <laughs> oh no! Welcome back, Kevin. Welcome Thank you. back. Thank you. Oh my God, that was incredible. Kevin, that was incredible. It, it wasn't the same without you here, but goodness gracious. So we'll we learned the call the call the hogs and kevin's going to teach us how to call the cock so this is great but if you're new to the the channel hit that like and subscribe button so guys we just had heston kerstad who's currently the triple a player of the week he's one of the orioles top prospects but above all dude he's just a great guy you want to root for and i've told you guys this before his mindset take away his ability which is damn good oh his ability he's a stud but his mindset, what he tries to do and what he tries to accomplish, why don't you want to root for a guy like that? Yeah. And uh, you got to see it a little bit firsthand on right there. Also, like, I don't, I mean, obviously we only saw him from, like, the shoulders up, but, like, he just doesn't look like a guy that can hit bombs like that. Do you oh. ever, like, just walking down the street and you're like, there's no way that guy can he's, do that. And then all uh, of a sudden, he just rip- Hell, though, man. Like, he's like a freaking, if you see him I, in person, he's a freaking big dude. Like, not like yeah. Yeah, I get what you mean, though, Brad. Yeah, that's but that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, like I you, there's there's certain guys you just look at and you're like, there's no way that guy's hitting 500 foot bombs, and then he just does it like it's nothing. It's, well, it's like the it's like the baby face and like yeah, that yeah, whole or thing. Like, yeah, like uh, even when I look at Wells sometimes because Wells looks like he's 12, and I'm just like, how does that guy throw heaters like that? It's just crazy. Well, what, well, we're talking about a big guy. He, he that that he's is a huge. large human being. Yeah. Also, Dude. Mike Bauman, large human being. Yeah. Heston, Heston's strong and like his legs. That's where a lot of hitters, when you look at with players, it's the ability to obviously to, to generate power, right? And for Heston, you know, they always say if you have like tree trunks for legs, he just has, generates so much uh, power from his legs. And then his bat is so quick. Yeah. 
it just pops off. And then you sit there and you're like, what the hell? He's right, though. He doesn't pull a ton of baseballs. His thing, and actually, have it on the breakdown here when I eventually do this in a little bit. Meant to do it from before. And Zach's telling it, too. Zach's seen him. Heston is stacked. Yeah. And also, Zach Lather, by the way, former Baltimore Oriole, former teammate of Ryan Ripken and a friend of the Ryan Ripken show. Uh, he will come on and bother us, or I will bother him to come on the show. He's already signed the waiver. The waiver is you're coming on the show. So, so uh, if you were if you were a young, aspiring baseball player, let's say in high school, the rule of thumb is to not skip leg day. Is that, is that, is that what I'm getting? Yeah, Rocco, no need to skip leg day when we're getting bigger. We've talked about this. And, <laughs> like, Twice a week, it's just genetics. So you can thank my dad, even though he's got like massive calves. It's just like an old man thing, I guess. Yeah, it's a dad like, thing. I just don't have the like big legs that I should. I'm doing legs twice a week. By the way, I want to bring this up since we had passing on. Dude, we were like probably 10 to 15 minutes removed from him tweeting on our show because he yeah. was tweeting about Framber Valdez was scratched from today's start. And I know that's not something huge, but dude, I feel like when he was like, Look, I thought when he was like looking at his phone when you were talking, I was like, "Do we have something? Do we have something?" You should have said something. Should be like, "What do you got?" Yeah, what do you got, Jeff? Yeah. Actually, yeah. I feel like that it because it's you literally what we just talked. We should have just had a conversation of like, Jeff, you just tweeted this out on yeah. the show. Should have been like, <laughs> you, you, we, you cannot leave until there is news so that we yeah, can exactly. have a break like, on the show. Hold you hostage until you drop a passing bomb, like please. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, this I do feel like this is exactly what we just talked about. It's because Valdez needs. An MRI now, it looks like on his elbow, and he's one yeah. of the top pitchers. And so it's just Dude. literally what we were talking to him about. It's and another also, issue. I yeah. didn't, we didn't bring, we didn't talk about this, but like, why, why is it going to put Juju like that on Grayson? Oh, no, we're not we're even going to talk about here. it. No, I don't, I don't we're not say saying it. it. I don't even want to say it. I knocked on wood so much when he was saying that. I was sitting here just, <laughs> oh my God. Ooh, that was <laughs> that weird. Was, in was my ear. I did not like that. that I'm me. so sorry, everyone. <laughs> that was me. Okay, oh. Don't do it again, Bronco. Jesus. But, but, right. but, but it's right, though, that the thing, actually, guys, it's been a really great episode for those that have tuned in. Jeff Passing gave so much insight on what's been kind of happening, and he gave a really big insight even with the Baltimore Orioles. First off, the team is okay right mm -hmm. now, and the team is loaded in the minor leagues. I think he said both. He, I think he answered that very well. He actually gave the cry face for the that Orioles. so funny. <laughs> when he did that, we all looked at each other. And we're like, oh. I wasn't even looking because I was looking at the camera. Uh, and so, like, when you all were laughing, I was like, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Hilarious. He was like, I'm so Dude, sorry. You're 101. Baseball team. Like, I thought he was doing it to you at first. But then he was just um, like, And then when he called, then when he called the Tides the greatest show in baseball, I think that was music to a lot of, you know, O's fans' ears. That was pretty sick to hear him say that, too. Well, he did ask, being like, Heston, how, why the hell do you have 25 RBIs? And he's like, well, you know, I'm just trying to figure it out how to keep that the next week. You know, and that's really it. Sometimes when you're on a streak, you don't even know how you fully do it, to be honest. But what Heston's doing, and I said it last year, and you guys have heard me talk about it, I thought he was, like, as far as pure bad as a lefty, uh, the, the dude's special. I, I really do think that he can rival anybody on the team as far as the power and the production you're seeing that at the triple a level his time's coming everyone just got to be patient so again if you make sure you hit that like and subscribe button answer the poll have a good time zach we appreciate it man what a great group of guys running this show yeah we do have a pretty good good group of guys running this show zach are you referring to this group zach stick together so this, yes he is this one man group huh one man group <laughs> Brad, wow. Brad is the Ryan Ripken show. <laughs> that was the, that was a running show. What did I say, Brad? What did I say earlier? I was like, I am the Ryan Ripken show. That's, That's yeah. literally what yeah. Kevin just said <laughs> verbatim. Which, which, by the way, if you are watching the show, we should do this more often. And you are a small business looking to sponsor the show, please hit me up at Brad at the Ryan Ripken Media at RyanRipkenMedia dot com because. That's that was the running joke. I'm calling people and telling them that I work with the Ryan Ripken show, and then they answer me like, "Yeah, okay, sure." <laughs> I'm just like, come on. <laughs> uh, that, so that being said, uh, we we have an answer. We haven't gone out of the room and answered the poll. Please let's answer a, it because I have another one uh, coming up. So the the winners. This poll actually got tighter as the show went on. Thirty five percent won nineties. Uh, Okay. Eighties came in in second with twenty six percent, and two thousands was twenty five. Nineteen seventies got twelve percent, and I know that there's probably like mm -hmm. age bias there, yeah. but the seventies had some bangers too. Animal mm -hmm. House is in the seventies. What was uh, Happy Gilmore? Was what not uh, late? That was nineties. Nineties, dude. That's those movies are. I mean, 
What, what's your what's your take, Brad? Like, My, you, it, mine's got it's got to be '90s. I mean, you had so many good, like, yeah, you had all the Adam Sandler movies, all the Chris Farley movies, Jim Carrey. I mean, there's just so much good. Uh, well, and, and there's also uh, the Nutty Professor was in the '90s. God, dude, the fart scene is hilarious in that. Yeah, yeah. So, like, there's just so many good comedy movies in the '90s that I don't think that there is one decade that just had so many bangers like that outside of outside of the '90s. 2000s was great, but I don't think it's anything like the '90s was. No, I agree. Yeah, there's a lot of good movies. You know, a lot of people are getting. We need to put more of those up. By the way, we put up the the thoughts last night about movie you have to watch like when you yeah. have to throw it on there like mine yeah. obviously austin powers is just i told my sister about it she was all fired up she started quoting just as much as me <laughs> yeah. Brad. of uh, course she was yeah so you need a pick of you in, in the halloween costume so that's like it should be for the next show that needs to be you need to like ask kelly if she can try to dig in the archives and find that because i think that's a lot of people love to see that she probably doesn't have to do a whole lot of digging i'm sure it's on the shelf <laughs> in the living room probably, yeah. dude, it's probably on like the refrigerator yeah yeah. Smoke in a pancake, pipe, pipe in a crepe. <laughs> Nothing beats the smell of your own brand. Oh, uh, yep. Well, hey, you're not wafting, right. Wafting, wafting. <laughs> wafting. All right. All right. All right. How about we get back into a little bit of baseball hit chatter here for a Speaking moment? Speaking of baseball, there is a pullout. I know that I'm going to, we're going to speak to this just uh, coming up here. So I wanted to make sure we got ahead of it. But I, I put in a poll here. There's already 24, 24 votes that came in. So a lot of people are engaging on this one. How many MLB teams can the Tides actually beat? And the reason why I asked this was because it was kind of swirling around on Twitter. So I thought it would be a good question for us to answer here on the show. 8% say zero. 12% say one. Two per, uh, 38% say two. So far right now, 40, 42 people or 42% are saying that the Tides could beat three teams. I believe that is a little bit ridiculous. All right, I, I have to... Do I get John Means rehab? Like, if John Means gets to be my pitcher, I think no, that right changes that. So, right, like, right now. Ten, you know, if, if we're talking like John Means gets to go out there and start, I think maybe we're talking a little bit different. But I, here's what I'll I would say. say one. I'll let you think about it. I think they could, they could just pull one off, like that kind of thing. It's not going to be likely. Like, they're not going to be favored. They'd be big underdogs. But if the front four of that lineup have just insane days, I could see it. Here's what I'll say. The pitching sucks. Yeah. So I mean, it, if you if you That's actually what I'm saying John means if you actually to be. saw the, watched any of the games uh, or, or were at any of the games uh, in Charlotte, like uh, they were just high scoring games all the way around. So yeah, the offense went crazy, but so did the 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 Knights' offense because yeah. once they got to that bullpen, it was just like it became mm -hmm. a game again. I would like to say this also: if you ever play in a game where it looks like a football score. It is the worst time to be a pitcher yeah. because you sit there. For, if you're on the team that's getting smacked, you're like, well, I don't want to go in there because whoever goes in there is just getting hit. It's just like it's an unsaid thing in baseball where if a team's getting absolutely smacked, if you're in the game, you're yeah. fucked. Yeah. Like it, it is. And then on the other side of it is when you're trying to keep going, you're like, man, I'm sitting around for a long time. It stinks. So, yeah. yes, I, the, the Tides didn't have the best run for pitching, but it also doesn't help when you're having an absolute track meet going on there on the baseball field where it just people are running after balls in the outfield, fans are running to the other side of the street to go get home run balls because there's so many outside of the, the stadium. Yeah. But also, and Brad, we talked about this, and this is, again, don't discredit also the big league guys, by the way. Like Brent Rooker on the A's even talked about, and I get it, the A's are not the worst team in baseball right now, by the way. But the A's, Brent Rooker even talked about it. He was Brad, on, on the show. He's on, he on the show and talked about it, that it's not the same when you're facing who you're consistently facing in the big leagues, and that is true. That's right. He said that uh, you know every time you go up the bat, once you get past the the, the starting pitcher, it's just like a reliever com comes out, and it's almost just like uh, uh, hitting against the starting pitcher all over again. So you know, Ro Rod Riggs actually tried to call me out says how is three ridiculous get out of here but then he if, said you know ball no uh, he, said, he said you don't he know said ball you know oh, maybe it's you don't know ball. <laughs> well, i was gonna say you do know ball i don't know ball 
He tried. He tried to say. I'm telling you, there is no chance in hell that uh, the Tides are winning a series against any MLB team right now. Period. And I will say that I think that they could beat a team. The yes. Mar the Marlins, like they probably could beat the Marlins. They're not beat. They're not winning a series against the Marlins. Maybe they would have to do it in Colorado. Like, just make all pitching just, you know, it's just a fly ball home run derby type. I think, you know. If it's a home run derby, maybe. But like, oh, well, I'm well, just saying if you play in Colorado where just yeah, pitching yeah, 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 gets yeah, destroyed yeah, yeah, no matter how good yeah. you are, that would probably have to be an e equalizer. Ba baseball, how it is, and yeah, any team at any level, it really is your pitching matchup. Yeah. That's what, if we're going to be completely honest, take out the lineups of it. Yes, and, and Rod, I'm seeing it. Uh, a game, not a series. Yes, teams can win games against big league teams depending on how well the pitcher does. So even like a guy like Cade Povich that's yeah. been pitching really well, he's a guy that if Cade goes out there and gives you six and dominates, that all's good, right? So John Means going out there to pitch well, it, it's all good. So the, my point that we're trying to get off, and I know I'm being distracted because Rocco is a five-year-old kid when he's pulling up comments, and it's a, it's a funny one about yeah, the co-host. It, was it wasn't you? Okay. It was you. I know it was you. So, but so the point the point is, pitching dictates everything, and you can stay in a game. Now, you heard Jeff Passon talk about it earlier. These five hitters, that top five in the order for the Tides, are are nasty. He said it was the greatest show in baseball right now because of what they're doing, and I truly do believe all of those guys are major league bats. Do you yeah. think that? Do you think that they think that they can beat a major league team? No in a game, not a series. No what do you? Think? I'm like for. When you were a part of a AAA roster rip, did you ever think that or did your teammates ever think that, like, okay, like, we're good enough to beat a team in the actual show? Or did that never cross your mind? It could be a you really – Okay, be, when, when a game – yeah, like, when you're in – when you see spring training, that's what happens with guys. Like, they, teams can beat other teams depending yeah. on the talent that you have. And, and if you're – and it's really, though, if your pitcher goes out there and dominates, like, if Paul Skeens is in AAA and he pitches really well – yeah, no doubt you're going to win. It depends on your pitching matchup. Now, for a series, though, this is what I try to say. The difference between the minors and the majors is the consistency of arms you're going to see specifically coming out of the pen. That is the biggest difference that you see is that the relievers, it's not like, oh, okay, you want to try to, oh, a game's out of reach, so we'll get the, the longer relief guy or we'll get the guy that doesn't get as many innings. No, the guys in the big leagues are all there for a reason because they are solid pitchers and they earn the right to come up there. Like, as much as people like to look around at that, that's why when you look at, like, teams like the – when everyone's worrying about the Yankees, the Yankees' bullpen has just been very good. And there's there's no really, like, weak link in their group right now. So go look at the bad teams, too. Oakland just took two out of three, I think, from Detroit. Mm -hmm. Oakland's yeah. not supposed to be a great team, but they had good pitching matchups. They had timely hitting. And their bullpen, like I said, there's more better pitchers on a major league staff. Uh, yeah, I mean – the tides beating the White Sox right now? Are they beating what Gavin Sheets and the I, White Sox? I can't give that to Gavin. I can't do that to Gavin. Are they? Beat, I can't do that. Are they beating the Marlins? Oh. Well, right now I think anyone just the way that the Marlins are playing. Yeah. yeah, those two teams only have one 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 win on the on the season so far. So the White Sox are one and eight. The Marlins are one and nine. The next worst team will be the Rockies uh, at two and eight. Yeah. I mean, so if they're if I I just don't see how the tides could actually beat all three of those teams. So that, the, well, and, and again, one game series series, I think, no one game. Yes. Anything no. can happen in baseball. And again, it dictates, I'll say for the last time, it dictates who starts on the mound for the team. Yeah. That's really it. Guy pitches. Well, you got a chance to beat anyone. That's why in the, in the postseason, well, in the postseason, that's when they talk about pitching, a pitching matchup can dictate the best lineups. That, that Friday night game where we just talked about Heston, Knocking the cover off the ball into into the park in Charlotte, uh, they were up 10, 10 to nothing in the first inning and came back and won the game in extra innings. By the way, eleven to ten. So that that's my point. It's just like, yeah, okay, they can hit a bunch of bombs, but like they got to be able to to keep the other team from scoring too. And you know, it's just uh, I, I don't know if they can do that against a major league team right now. Yeah, we'll we'll find out. But you know what? The I'll tell you what. Tide's got a lot of talent. Oh they, my god, they really yeah. do, and it, and it is. Very fun to see what happens. And, um, you know, overall, it's baseball. At the end of the day, you have one good pitching matchup. Anything can happen. That's just the nature of the beast. So if you're new to the channel, hit that like and subscribe button. Ryan Ripken Show. 
Uh, we do this every Monday and Thursday. We'll sprinkle in Sundays. And if we have special occasions, we will also go live. We have this on the audio part. We have this on YouTube. So if you can't watch us, we want you to watch and engage, just like we have this community. If you're listening to this on the audio, if you're live with us, you can chat with us as we go about the stream. The other part, too, if you have any inquiries on The Ryan Rifkin Show and want to know more, Brad's right. We mentioned it earlier. Email brad at ryanrifkinmedia.com. We will put this out there as well for those that can see it if you have any questions concerns uh as we continue to grow we're continuing to grow this community more and more all right guys let's dive into the last kind of the segment of of today because we've been talking for a while but we've had some great guests that's why we're running longer it's a part of it and we're trying to ease kevin back in from his sickness thank you thank you still i've been coughing a little bit but i've been i made i've made sure to turn so right right into that yeah, he, yeah he's been dabbing over here so. <laughs> that, little, little, little dab so yeah. uh yeah if you could see the thumbnail on my locked on nfl show from monday i can't, can't I, I have to laugh i literally look like i'm gonna die on the screen it's just oh i'm gonna i'm gonna pull i'm putting in the discord by the way we have a discord we're trying to get better i think we are getting better yeah, we are i think better. we are, we are getting but better. i will put that in uh not announcements but i'll put that in one of the channels in discord for people to see because it is it is funny. No, speaking, speaking of which, I'll put that Discord link up. Go follow us on this in Discord. Yeah, we're almost to 100 members actually. So listen, there's a lot of good chatter in there during games. It's great. Yeah, love well, it. There's a lot of people that love the chatter, specifically about the Orioles. We have other um, uh, forums in there. You can talk about other sports, but obviously everyone has the the itch for Baltimore baseball. Uh, before then, we get ready to, to preview the Red Sox. I guess let's take a trip because we got to take a ride up there. And Kevin, we need oh, to I back did. I for miss this. I miss doing this. I have to get Let's ready. Let's take a ride in our Adams Jeep on up to Fenway Park as the Orioles head to play the Red Sox. And everyone's getting on their Jeep. Brad's on his Jeep rocking. What Ke- Rocco, what are you doing? Oh gosh. Yeah, Kevin. Rocco. You can't ride the Jeep right. How was that pee pee? <laughs> oh goodness. There it is. You, you ride Christ. it whatever way you want, but uh, our, uh, the Adams Boss. Jeep Ad- can we get through a damn sponsorship? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I was ri- I was riding hard last week, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing Chuck over there loves us. Oh goodness, let's talk about Adam Sheep of Maryland here for a second. A proud sponsor of the Ryan Ripken Show. You see the nice sign right behind Zach right there. Boom, baby, Adam Sheep of Maryland. If you need anything done with your car service, they are the best to do it. They are really hands on, and I'll, I'll, again, they have a pre owned special. If you want to buy a pre owned vehicle up at Adam's Jeep which is located in Aberdeen, Maryland. doesn't have to be a Jeep. It can be any other of their selected vehicles there. If you tell them you watch the Ryan Ripken Show and you purchase a car, you get a $500 gas card. You can either say you hate Rocco or you enjoy the Ryan Ripken Show. One of the two will get you that $500 gas card with the pre-owned vehicle. So, guys, let's talk about this next series because a lot of people are, are up in arms about what just happened and transpired in Pittsburgh. The Orioles very well could have won all three games. But instead, they drop two of three in heartbreaking fashion. We saw that. That happens. It's baseball. It's over with. I'm going to just tell people, and it was earlier in the show, I'm not going to get into this Austin Hayes slander right now. I'm not going to get into all that. Those guys earned the right to continue to play well. Jeff Passan even discussed it. These guys, give it time. The Orioles are going to figure it out. And despite them trying to figure it out, they're still five and four on the season. And guess what? They can't dwell on the past, right? Because you know how the Red Sox are playing right now? They're pretty. They're playing some pretty damn good baseball. And they're sitting, I believe, I believe they're sitting at 7-3 and three going into the series. And they are actually, surprisingly, guys, Zach, the top-rated pitching team in baseball in, as far as Team ERA. That was something that people are quite surprised about, especially with the talent that they have. Yeah, I mean, I think going into it, Going into the season, especially if you asked anyone in Boston what the downfall of the Red Sox were going to be, all offseason they were screaming that they needed pitching. They need they wanted Jordan Montgomery. Even we had Kyle Corwin on last time uh, a few episodes ago. He was talking about it, how they had Jordan Montgomery literally working out in their backyard, working out in Boston, and weren't able to get anything done with him. And it was something that truly Red Sox fans worried about. It was something like this team can't do anything with this offense or with this pitching and what do they do like you said through 10 games the best era in baseball and 
the Orioles are getting three of their aces or three, their three best pitchers. So it's going to be a good series. Obviously, Corbin Burns versus Brian Bellow is the first one. That by itself is going to be an incredible game. So I'm excited for that. But in Boston, anything can happen. Yes. You got the wall. You have, you know, we have pesky pole. We have 420 dead center. It just, and especially in that ballpark, I feel like it can be a pitcher's nightmare because pop-ups to left suddenly just graze the wall and now it's a double. Yeah, and to, to, to allude to that, the Red Sox have actually been swinging the bats pretty well, especially on the road. And we're, I'm going to get into a little bit of a breakdown of two specific players on the Boston Red Sox that are really tearing it up. They do have the names like Rafael Devers and Tristan Casas, who really, quite frankly, haven't gotten fully going yet. It's these other two guys that we're going to discuss that you need to watch out for. But pitching-wise, the Orioles are going to have Corbin Burns, Cole Irvin, and Grayson Rodriguez slated to go, while the Red Sox are going to have Brian Bello, uh, Nick Pavetta, and I believe it is Cutter Crawford. So I actually got to face Cutter Crawford in the minor leagues quite a lot. And guys, this Boston, it's Boston's opening day, by the way, at home. So it's the Orioles' third opening day, and they're, they're going to have third opening game. They're going to have to do the festivities, the high fives, and all of that. So it's a 2 o'clock game to start the series. This is not a, a, a do-or-die time at all, and I want people to understand that, Brad. And, we, and that's, that's the point here with the Orioles. Yes, they let a couple games get away that they could have won, but also is it fair to say that they also stole a couple games against Kansas City? Yeah. Are we kind of on that same pattern? So despite that they haven't won – the, the way that people are hoping, they are still finding more ways to win than to lose. Yeah, and, and you know, the thing of it is, uh, 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 there's been a lot of chatter amongst fans about the pitching, and I'm kind of thinking to myself, well, the pitching is actually pretty phenomenal. Yeah, Tyler Wells has taken a while to settle down in both of his games so far, but once he's once he's settled in, you're not hitting off of that guy. And Dean Kramer had a, an, an amazing outing. You and I talked about it yesterday. Yep. Had a great uh, uh, outing yesterday. Shout out, Dean. Hope you're watching. Shout out, Dean. He's a good kid. I told he said, I just want to go out there and make you proud, Ryan. I said, Dean, you make me proud every single day. Just don't give up any runs. I feel like that's you with Dean, and then uh, me and me and Bauman have a thing. You guys might be I, having a, a growing bromance. I might. I may have commented on uh, that that high socks are the way to go, and <laughs> he did say that it was for me. But <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, the pitching has been actually. Incredible. Uh, Craig Kimbrell has has done really well. I um, I I don't want to say I'm concerned, but the 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 bats are an issue. I, I think that, that that's something that does need to be just kind of addressed. That that they have that they, they have to wake up. But the thing of it is, there's all star hitters. There's a there's a rookie of the year. They're gonna figure that out. It's it's way too early to be to be getting this crazy off a team that won 101 games last year with basically this roster. You yeah. know, I, I I don't think that there's nothing, there isn't anything to worry about, and the bats will come alive. And it does it, bringing up anybody from the minors isn't going to change the fact of, that the bats are are a bit quiet at the moment. Well, and it's also names that uh, that the Orioles aren't going to part with right now. Yeah, and that's things. Austin Hayes for all the ones that are saying that because that's the name I keep seeing. Right, everyone's mm -hmm. seeing that out there. Stop giving it bats to Austin Hayes. You know, Austin Hayes hasn't. If I looked at that correctly and I thought I had my stats, I don't think Austin Hayes has hit below 250 in his entire big league career when he's played uh, being up in Baltimore. I'm actually going to look that up right now. Austin Hayes also, I think people forget, starts slow every single year. And then by yeah. mid-May, people are like, why is he not an all-star? Right. It, yeah. This is just, he's always been a guy that's taken a week or two for him to get his feet on. Even last year, he had the second game of the year was five for five game. And then I believe he was like seven for his first 32 still. Well, like, it's, it's just something that it takes him a moment, right. and then he's back to Austin Hayes. Right, and so what, what Ryan was saying is like, it, if you're going to send somebody down, who is it? What, are you going to send Cedric down? Well, are the you thing, send, everyone uh, wants to say you're Urias. Like, oh, we'll make room for the guys. And also, for those, and this is going to bother some people, Jackson Holiday is not not – Jackson Holiday is not in the big leagues because Ramon Urias is on the team. I'm just going to point that out there, in my opinion. I don't think that's no, the reason why. No. Um, Urias had a really good defensive game on Sunday, too, by the way. So, and the, the thing is, he's also, uh, we can talk about the numbers changing very quickly as players. And for Austin Hayes, his only time I wanted to comment on that or to fix it, he hit 217 when he was initially called up as a rookie. When he when he hit the minor leagues by storm, like and he crushed it down there. If you go back and look at that year in 2017, 
At age 21, it was sensational. And since then, he's had some injuries, obviously. But Hayes overall has not hit below 250 in any season that he's played in Baltimore. So while we're saying that you might not be happy with the start for Austin Hayes, he's had 26 at-bats on the season. 26 at-bats can change, and you are you get five hits in a week or a series, things change just like that. Bo Bichette and Vlad Guerrero Jr. are both hitting under 200. Yeah. You think the Blue Jays are going to get rid of those guys? They should. They should get rid of everyone if they're not hitting good immediately That's to right. start the season. Yeah. And and I know what's, it's... What's, what's Vlad Jr. batting? He's batting right around the same as uh, Bo. It was right at like 190. Yeah, send him down. Get, Send them get, all down. get rid of them. This, this happens in every single sport. And I think for the Orioles, it's about expectations too. everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think you could even talk about the conversation we had a couple weeks ago about how difficult June is. And everybody saying, well, you got to win now because June, you're playing playoff team after playoff team. And they're what? There's like one off day in there or something. Yeah, only one. Like, oh, if you, if you can't win 29 out of your first 33 games, like. <laughs> season's over because you're going to lose all these games in June. But, that you know, yeah. they're not going to lose. I've, at least I don't think they're going to lose all these games in June. But, again, it's just we're, we're nine games in. Some people struggle to start the year, and then they pick it up. And yeah. that, that's what it is in every single sport. And to keep this context going so far, it's that players still make impacts even if they're not having the numbers to reflect it. So Cedric Mullins, for me, if you watch that series against the Pirates – you might you would understand what Cedric did on the ball field. Not look, but if you look at just the stats and go, oh, he hit 143. Cedric was a part of an assist that got an out at the plate. He's made some tremendous plays in the field. By the way, he didn't have a hit in the game that he had two RBIs, and it was the Jordan Westberg sliding into home. Mm -hmm. That was Cedric that hit it, but his at bat before sack fly that got the Orioles uh one run closer and said also hit his second home run of the year. So what I'm saying is those are guys where they impact the game in different ways that you can't always just look at a stat sheet and explain what's going on. It's going to take time. I, I also think, you know, kind of what Kevin talked about expectations, everyone always said to start the year, oh, the, the Orioles start this year off. They got to be, like you said, they, got, they should win 29 of the thir first 33 because these teams are so bad, you know. It's all these bad teams. To start this year, the Orioles, the Angels, who they took two, two of three from, are five and four. The Kansas City Royals are six and four. Now we go, we got the Boston Red Sox at seven and three. So these teams, hell, the Pirates, eight and two. So there was this notion that the Orioles had this extremely easy start and that it, they were just going to be able to run through every single team. These are young, scrappy teams that have shown throughout the past first 10 days, games of baseball, that they are going to compete and be in almost every single game. So like you said, it's so much because of expectations. People thought the Orioles should be 10 and 0 at this point because they're not playing anyone. They have played, they're going to play their fourth very good ball club this year. Yeah, the teams are off to hot starts and it's early. Teams are trying to figure it out, but I promise you things are going to get rolling more. And I'll discuss a little bit more about that. You guys can just, to, uh, decide what you want to talk about, whether Kevin's ready for Kevin's full corner while I get, <laughs> excuse me, while I get ready to break down what you need to look for in this Boston Red Sox series, specifically the two players that are red hot up there in Beantown. But now back to Kevin's corner and Zach. Yes, uh, Kevin's corner's back. And we can, we can continue the conversation, honestly, because, you know, Ryan's exactly right where teams are starting hot. So maybe we look back and, and Pittsburgh is like, oh, well, they lost power, like whatever amount of games, you know, they're, they're going to be a team that competes. But it's a matter of streaks. Like right now, yeah. Pittsburgh's playing really good baseball. And, mm -hmm. you know, if we look back on this in uh, August, September, and we say, oh, well, the Pirates lost all these games. How could they drop those yep. two early ones to Pittsburgh? And how could they have that happen? It's just a matter. And I think the other big conversation, well, there are a couple, Zach, I think. The first one is with Gunner and just – what's happening right now has been a lot of a lot of discourse and i think a lot of it is very much so early and over stupid. reactionary i'll say where, it's all stupid again i'm not saying gunner can't play better right i'm yeah. not i'm not saying that but we know who gunner is gunner has enough of a sample size now and at this point like yeah sure you'd like to see more immediate production but on this team on this roster gunner is one of the last guys that i'll freak out about even yeah. with early season struggles. I mean, yeah, I mean, and yeah, he had a rough, what, four game stretch, five game stretch, 
before that we were all pounding the MVP drum. So it's going it baseball, like you said, it's a game of streaks. It's can you get hot at the right times? Jeff Passon just said it. He said, all you want in a season is to get the lottery ticket. Yeah. As soon as you get that playoff spot, we watched, as he said, the Rangers versus the Diamondbacks, who a week before the playoffs, you More, didn't think yeah. either of those teams were even making yeah. the playoffs. And now they're that's your World Series because both teams just got incredibly hot at the right time. It's And that's all it's about. It's get your lottery ticket, get into the dance, and then see what happens from there. Gunnar Henderson, like you said, is the last person I'm going to yeah. give up on or think, oh, man, this is a rough, you know, this isn't working out. Then there was his throw. And I, let, let's mm-hmm. address this. There are very few people who even get to that ball that he got to. Yeah. If yeah. there are a lot of other shortstops where they don't have that throw because the game's over on the RBI single up the middle. All right. Gunner gets to that ball. He makes an incredible play. Rushes it. Yeah. You know, it happens. He makes that play 99 times out of 100. Unfortunate that that's the time. It's it's like the McKenna drop. You know, it, at the end of the yeah, day, kind of yeah, yeah. It's an early season. You have that one play that uh, game goes differently, and you're like, oh, season's over. If the number of people that thought the season was over after McKenna dropped that ball last year, I remember. You I remember. Yeah, you, it, it's almost like, and I love I love the fan base, but we in a lot of ways we treat each game like a football game, like there are only 17 of them. We have 153 games left. Yeah, there is a lot of baseball to be played. If you're getting down and stressed about it right now, worried about Gunner and them, it's going to be a long season because I I have full confidence that these guys are going to snap into form and this team is going to take off like we expect it to. Right. You know, again, I'm not blaming anybody for having expectations. You should have expectations. Yeah. This team is really good. They have a lot of talent. But essentially to say, and I have seen it, I'm not just kind of pulling this out of nowhere. I have seen a tweet or two where it's like, okay, well, season is doomed. I mean, Gunner's not going to bounce back, this, that, and the other. That, that, Those are the types of overreact. It's okay to have expectations. It's okay to want the team to play better. It's, it's okay I was going to do it if Brad that. didn't. What? Yeah, Rocco was just got pulled up on screen as he was downing some popcorn. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even see. Oh, man. But uh, yeah, it, it's that kind of thing, too. And then the other conversation, and Rocco, maybe if you're not eating popcorn, you can jump in here. Yeah, he is. Oh, okay, never mind. But um, the other conversation, specifically about yesterday, is uh, the bullpen usage, particularly with Cano versus, you know, a guy like Kimbrell. And it's like, if they had brought in Kimbrell instead of Cano, it would have been a discourse of all, oh, well, because Cano had what? A day, two days? Yeah, he had a, he had a day rest, and Kimbrell had pitched on back-to-back days. They weren't this early in the season going to use Kimbrell. So, yeah, I agree. It's essentially that, where, you know, either way, Orioles lose that game with Kimbrell on the mound or with Cano there's going to be discourse about it no matter what, where it's okay. Why didn't you use Cano in that situation when he had the day of rest? Whereas now, since it was Cano on the mound and again, you can't load the bases and, and have that happen. I'm not making an excuse, but at the same time, it's okay. Well, now you're not using your closer. That's the discourse yeah. around it now. Yeah. And I think because we were so spoiled last year with Felix Bautista that people assume that every closer is going to be perfect. Felix Bautista is a different animal. You know, he's someone that you can go out there. And even I believe uh, Freddie Gonzalez talked about it after the extra innings loss. He said, you loved last year in extra innings. You could, Rocco was just downing this popcorn. It is so (laughs) hard to focus. I'm looking, looking over. That is what what, what brand is that? Nothing like, oh, dude, it's the best brand. First popcorn original. I'm telling you. But we'll, we'll make a poll on this, but I, I'm smart food white cheddar till I die. I love that, but I'm saying yeah. if, you're going, if you're going like original, like artificial butter, whatever, yeah. this is the way to go. Smart Pops the OG. I mean, that's so good. But yeah. Or, I guess for actual like, you know, if we're doing like microwave stove, Jiffy Pop. Oh, that's yeah. that's, that's that's the classic right there. Dude, the, um, what was that? What was the good stuff? It was like the the smart pop, like ultimate movie theater butter. You just like pop it in. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm so upset they don't make And if anybody knows where this is, this is a very off-topic thing, by the way. I realize we're doing that. But they used to have these, like, I guess they were called unpoppables. And it was, like, half pop, pop. So it was pretty much, like, in the middle of a kernel and a full, you know, popped yeah. thing. And 
it would have all different flavors of them. It was like a conductor, it was the mascot, like a conductor kernel. And I don't think they make them anymore. And it's what so brand, upsetting. Guys? Huh? What brand was it? I don't remember what it was, what the brand, if, if, if it's shown, like I will, I'll recognize it, but the mascot was like a conductor kernel. And it's in the middle between a uh, just regular popcorn kernel and a fully popped one, and they called them, I think, unpoppables or can't remember what it was, but they don't they don't sell them anymore, and it is deeply upsetting to me. I don't know what it is, but I'm I'm a very big you know just microwave popcorn, you know, get the they they have all this crazy stuff too, like they got yeast you can put in there now, like nutritional stuff, and the the cheese you can put on there. Popcorn is crazy. I'm a big popcorn guy, yeah. so. Dude, they came out with the uh, the new Smart Pop. I don't know if you're like a big Zach. I don't know if you are either, but like caramel and cheddar cheese popcorn. Mm, yeah, Batman. cheddar cheese popcorn. So yeah. Because, are you a big kettle corn? I do like kettle corn, but down the you know at the shore, I would always get um, the caramel popcorn on the boardwalk, and if they had like the cheese or the butter one in there, it was fantastic. Mm. All right, Rod, how about you? How about you uh, pump the brakes a little bit there, bud? You've commented like seven times, just trying to roast us right now. How about you take a chill pill, or as Brad would say, Kimbrel's gonna be okay. Kimbrel's gonna be okay. Good lord, man. Relax yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I think once again, I think we're just spoiled with Felix Bautista last year, where it's at the point where we just think everything's gonna be perfect as soon as the pitcher comes in. And Cano, I believe he's given up two plus runs in an inning four times in his career. All four have been while he was pitching in the ninth. So, you know, I I think Kimbrell's always going to be the closer and I would have loved obviously to see him on Sunday, but there was no reason they were not going to pitch him three days in a row, especially this early. We saw last year what happens when he gets tired at the end of the year. He was used a crap ton at yep. the beginning of the year for Philly last year. And then it all came back and he was tired at the end. So it, it is one thing they're going to take it super slow. I think with him and making sure they watch him as much as they can. Also imagine that game does go to extras yesterday. And everything that goes on with that in terms of like the bullpen usage, if it goes deep mm -hmm. into extras, you know, if, if Gunner eats that throw, for example, they tie it up and they go yeah. like they go 12, 13 innings. Well, I mean, you're you're the bullpen rest guy. I mean, what does the bullpen look like at, at a point like that? Because so, they're, they're already well, exhausted. Yeah. So that was the thing is going into yesterday, there was no chance that pretty much anyone there was there was a lot of guys that. Actually, they even considered, I know they talked about on Mass and that Cole Irvin was on on call in the bullpen. Mm. So if he needed to go get some, uh, you know, I guess work in if what or Kramer doesn't pitch well off the bat, Cole Irvin was there to kind of save the bullpen. But it is it is one of those things where that's why Corbin Burns is pitching tomorrow. They have these guys in situations where they they aren't going to this early in the year. They're more worried about pitch counts and you know, how many innings guys pitch rather than, okay, here's situational stuff. They want to get Kimbrell in because he hadn't pitched in three, four days coming into Saturday. And so they were just, they had to get him in at that point. Yeah. All right. We ready? I think we're good. Right. Let's yeah. get it. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can't All see right, you though. Cool. You can't see me. How about now? Ooh, there we go. Okay, get better? Rock off the screen. Oh, goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right, so now it's time for a little bit of a breakdown series preview with the Red Sox and the Orioles. And I like to try to do the know your foe, right? So in this case, why don't we get to know your foe with the Boston Red Sox? Actually, previously, I did one on their first base slugger, Tristan Casas, who is not going to be featured in this because he's off to a slow start, but he is going to pick it up. I can guarantee you that. But a reason why the Red Sox are off to such a great start their pitching is number one in major leagues right now as far as Team RA. But they have two specific hitters that are red hot that are really driving this Red Sox lineup as they're trying to put it all together. So we're going to have talk about Tyler O'Neill and Jaron Duran, the two players specifically. Obviously, you guys know Gunnar Henderson. So as we can roll it. Man, how long did I make this thing? Here's a good example here of Tyler O'Neill. okay? So this is the player that I was referring to that is off to a red-hot start. So if you're going to look at it, he came from the St. Louis Cardinals, now with the Boston Red Sox. And specifically, if you want to look at his numbers, there are some num uh, years thrown in there, his best year being in uh, at 26 years old, at 286, 34 jacks, 80 ribbies. Guy's got the ability to drive the baseball. There's no doubt about that. But again, 
it's consistency. And over the last two seasons, not playing a full year, the numbers have dropped a little bit, specifically an average OBP, OPS, you name it, numbers not as high. Well, guess what? In 28 at-bats, he's already got five jacks, five ribbies, so that means he's got five solo home runs, and he has seven walks already on the season, and you're going to see what he's done so successfully so far this year. As I continue to roll the clip, all right, so this is in Seattle. And so a thing that we're going to talk about so far, O'Neill has five home runs on the season, and there's a theme. When he gets a fastball, he pulls it, and when it's an off-speed pitch, he'll go with it the other way. This is an example right here. Being a fastball, he's going to get it over the middle part of the plate. And being a big, strong guy that he is, this is a very hittable spot for him. So it's right at the top of the zone. Even with the velocity, he's able to get the bat to it. He's going to send this about a mile into the sky in Seattle. So again, you might think that that's not a terrible pitch, and it's not, but it's a pitch that Tyler O'Neill can drive, and he can do it effectively. Here's another example. He's going to get a fastball in here. He's going to get his bat, get his hands to it, and just smack it right through, and he's very quick to the baseball. He's not trying to do too much, and that's the, that's the key here. So he can hit velocity. It's not just, hey, I'm going to blow it by Tyler O'Neill right now. It's you got to be careful with where you lo locate your fastball. So right here, you're going to see pitch is going to be middle in. Tyler gets his hands in at 97, okay? So I wasn't kidding. I promise. I wouldn't lie to you about this. I can lie to you guys about some other things, but it's not about what I'm seeing Tyler O'Neill do so well, and that is he can hit top-end velocity. You're going to see one more example of it here. Fastball in, 94 sinker. See you later. That's what he's capable of doing, and he is swinging the bat just as well as anyone. He actually leads Major League Baseball in OPS at this specific moment. And I talked about it earlier. Fastballs, he's hitting out to left. Sliders, he's staying on and hitting out to right center, staying on the baseball. So for this example, slider's going to stay over the part of the plate. It's not enough off. Tyler's going to stay on it, drive it. And actually, this was his fifth consecutive opening day home run if we want to be actually really technical, which is insane when you think about it. And once again, slider's going to be away. It's not a terrible pitch, but it's still a pitch that's left up, and Tyler can do a lot of damage on it, and he does it right here going the other way. Again, it's little things, but for hitters, if you've seen me talk about the ability to drive the baseball the other way with authority only makes you better. And right now for Tyler – He's able to do both. Now, so far, to get him out, because we'll talk about on that Know Your Foes segment of this part, Tyler, just like a lot of guys, if he's good with hitting the slider, he can sometimes be baited into swinging at pitches away, but you got to be able to get it across the plate. You've seen so far on these pitches that are on the outside corner, they're trying to go lower part of the strike zone or try to be a chase pitch, and they leave it up. Right here, you're going to see if you're able to get him to swing at a pitch that's just barely out of the zone, you can have success at striking them out or getting them out. So right here, check swing. That's all obviously a beautifully placed slider. Check swing, gets them out in front, fools them. That's simple. Now here's the example. It's going to look like a really good pitch to hit, and this is actually just textbook nasty slider because it's going to be a strike up until the very end when it's not. So right here, it's going to fall off just outside the corner of the plate. Perfect location. So, again, if you're an Orioles pitcher, at least in this case, you don't want to make a mistake three or four inches on the plate right there. If you're going to try to go get him, especially with two strikes, you need to have it be finished low and going across the plate. I know it's easier said than done, right? It's, it's a lot harder than me just saying it, but obviously that's a trend with him. Now I want to talk about Jaron Duran here because this is a guy that I really like, and he's been like a catalyst for this team. This is his hit chart in 2023. Pretty damn good. He's able to spread the ball around the ballpark, be able to have some with authority. You see the pink, which represents home runs, purples, doubles. The guy hits it everywhere, right? So far this season, he's off to a tremendous start where, yes, he's only got one home run, but look at him using the whole field. And it's specifically, he's staying on the ball facing lefties. So for him, if he's able to stay on the baseball longer, he's going to have success. Here's an example. Pitch middle away. He's going to stay right on, stay right through it. Whammy. And again, it's a little thing, but it keeps things going. You can already see in the game, he's three for three. Same thing, pitch away, doesn't try to do too much. The, the lesson with, with hitters, by the way, don't try to do too much when you're facing lefties. 
Let it come to you because lefties in general, your first movement, what do you want to do as a left-handed hitter? You want to pull off the baseball. You have to fight that urge to want to pull off. You got to stay on it. And when you stay calm, cool, and collected, use the big part of the field. Things, Good things can happen. Now, here's the home run. He's got juice. I've seen it. I've faced him in double A. He's got a lot of talent. This is an absolute bomb. 99 right over the middle of the plate. Trout tries to get a beat on it, but you know what? You can't get the ball if it's over the fence. And that's just really impressive. So, again, Duran and O'Neill, if they stay hot, it's going to make it very challenging because it goes and coincides with what the Boston Red Sox are doing right now. They have the number one ERA in MLB, as, as I was referring to, with a 1-5-0 to start the year. The Orioles are pretty damn good right now at a 2 8 I know people are saying, the bullpen, what's going on? Overall, they're doing a tremendous job. Yes, the bats have been cold, but the formula for success is there. But the thing right now that I'm looking at is if Rafael Devers and Casas are going to get going, you need guys like O'Neill and Duran to cool off. Because another thing Duran does, he steals bags. He's already got six on the year, so he likes to wreak havoc when he gets on base. So we talked about you're seeing the importance of staying on the baseball, right? We talked about that. Well, I wanted to do this while we had him on. We're doing this back-to-back, so – we can actually be able to clip this and you can watch it later. And it's the Ryan Ripken show. Hit that like and subscribe button. But we just had Heston Kerstad on probably about an hour ago at this point. But the silent J, Heston, there's a reason why he's a person you need to root for. First off, great guy, tremendous talent with power everywhere. His first home run, first hit in Baltimore is a cutter in that he sends deep into the Camden Yards night. That's a cutter in off it off the plate three to four inches even despite the game being out of reach for the Orioles at that point you see what Heston is capable of doing but Heston even alluded to in the interview interview if you go back and watch he doesn't pull a ton of balls he can but his strength is the big part of the field because when you look at it, a guy that's that big and that strong why take away the ability to just do this when you can go all this way and you're actually going to see in the highlights that Heston's home runs that he's hit so far in AAA, a lot of them are the other way. But here's an example. Pitch is going to be well off the plate, and yes, this is going to bloop in, and sometimes you need to be uh, luckier. It's better to be lucky than good, but in this case, he's good and lucky. Well off the plate, but he stays on the ball so well, drops it in. Hey, how are you? Hit him more than not. Turns out to be a double. But I think I'm just trying to prove to people that he has great protection on the outside part of the plate. 94 away, he's not trying to do too much. He hits an absolute bullet to left right here. Again, simple hitting, simple approach, simple swing. And you can see with that leg kick that he has. It's one of those where you sit there and you're like, well, wait a minute, that kind of looks funky. But for me, his leg kick when we see it go up here, and this is now the games in AAA, by the way, where he just went absolutely uh, – what's the proper way to say this? He just went – Nuts. Shit. Yeah, that's one way to put it. He went nuts. But when you see right here, I just want to say about this leg kick before we show the highlights. He mentioned it. And I said, dude, you know, people sometimes say it looks weird. But for all hitters, you need to have that sensation that you're able to go back, get that balance. And once you can get to this balance point, you can then have so much power going forward. But you got to get to that, you know, I like to call it the hang. You got to have your hang if you have a leg kick like this. He gets to his hang. He gets to his balance position of where he needs to be being back. And as soon as he's able to get to that, he's then able to react and be able to drive the baseball a long way. So here's an example of one of those. That's a homer to left. Again, the power. Not trying to do too much. When you're that strong, use the whole field. And this is what makes Heston Kerstad so damn dangerous is that he can turn a pitch that hitters might or pitchers might think, ah, well, he might be able to get a hit the other way, if worst case. Well, it's like, well, damn, if I leave a pitch like that over the plate, guys like Heston are going to punish me over and over and over again. And I think that's the whole highlight there. I'll keep moving on. In it. And he's admired it, and, and he very well should. Here's the other one, left center field. Again, it is a hitter's park in Charlotte, and unfortunately, I'll be honest, a guy that didn't take advantage of that ballpark myself. But this was the game where he had 10 RBIs, I believe, the grand slam, things are going well. And by the way, the weather here isn't great. It's like 48 it degrees, freezing, yeah. raining. 
and they're just absolutely slugging the baseball left and right, just hitting the absolute crap out of it. But the theme with Heston, again, you see that leg kick. He's already in a good position, and it's effortless. It's effortless swings, and that's what makes it so exciting when you watch a guy like him. When you, It's effortless because you simplify what you need to do. You can see yourself have a lot of success, and you have to have natural talent as well. He has both. It, it really is fun to watch. I think I have one more lined up in here. There it is. Hanging slider, stays right on it. And I don't know, it's visiting the dragon out there. I don't even know where the hell the ball went. But another fan has another souvenir because Heston Kirsten has the ability. And I've told people this, and you guys have all heard me on the show. Heston can ma match any person on the Orioles team, in my opinion, as far as power potential. He can go for leading the team in home runs, RBIs, and the ability to be a cornerstone. And people asked me for a long time last year when it was the Dylan Cease sweepstakes and you need to trade these prospects for arms or whatever it may be. Heston Kerstad's not a guy that gets traded. I'm going to be honest right here. He's a cornerstone for the Baltimore Orioles. He's one of the best young hitters, not just with the Orioles, but in all of baseball, in my opinion. And he's got a great attitude. But he's a guy, his time's coming. Be patient. But when he gets to Baltimore... I expect a lot more of that, and there's a reason why he was taken so high in the draft. It's not because they're saying, oh, he's going to sign under slot. No. The Orioles thought he was the best left-handed bat in the draft, and they were damn right about it. And Heston Kerstad's going to be a Baltimore Oriole for a very long time. And, guys, I'm not going to move the camera back because we've been here for a while, and you guys are starting to slump and what's going on. But I want you guys to know also, talking to you all here, Hit that like and subscribe button for the Ryan Ripken Show. We'd appreciate that. And let me know in the future who you want me to break down next. It should be a fun one moving forward. Any final remarks here, Zach? Uh, did we did we acknowledge Don C's? Uh... We did not acknowledge Don's. Uh, I, I can't scroll back. But thank you, Don. Yeah. Thanks for the thanks yeah, for yeah, the thank you, Don. You're the man, Don. You're the man. I want to make sure took us too long, but you're the man. Rip, I do have a question <laughs> for you. Since Rod has been patiently waiting very patiently waiting for us to answer this question. Uh, since Craig Kimbrell, why would you bring him in the game, ninth inning, 2-2 two -two game on the road? Nobody does that with their closer, and that's why he couldn't pitch yesterday. Would you like to answer this question? Uh, so, okay, so, so, so I understand, and I heard it right. I'm trying to read it. So they're saying why he wasn't in in a 2-2 two -two game or why he was brought in in a 2-2 two -two game? Why he why? was brought in in a 2-2 two -two game in the ninth okay. inning. Why he was brought in, and it was game two, I believe, we're yeah. talking about? Yeah, Saturday. Yeah. So in, in this case, I think Oriole fans can be a little bit more – last year, let's put it with Felix Batista. People were spoiled from the fact that Brandon Hyde was able to bring him in in multiple situations, right? Tie game, lead, you were going to go to Felix Batista late, and he could go one or two innings, right? That's the reality of it. Early on, when you want to get guys in some sort of a rhythm, Craig Kimbrell hadn't gotten in a rhythm. He didn't pitch a lot uh, to start the first series because the games were not close with the Angels. I think in this case, it was a combination. He needs to get his work. But also, we're going back to that philosophy where Brandon Hyde said in a close game, I want to have my quote-unquote best guy in this situation at the moment because I think if we can get to this moment, we'll be able to figure it out later. That might not be the answer that you want, but you have to make a choice. And in this case, you either at times go, hey, my closer, which in the past Batista could give you two, you do that with him. Or in this case, you go, Craig, get us to the next inning, and then we'll go from there. Oh. And also, too, quite frankly, Craig Kimbrell is going to be in the closing role. And that might be a, a suggestion of saying we don't want to have to bring Craig into situations this early that might be out of the realm that we want him to be comfortable in. So what I'm saying is, Craig might be a guy that they're saying, hey, we just want you to be in, in the ninth. And I heard you guys talk about it earlier. He is a guy that you're going to have to limit to some capacity, and you have to pick your moments. So, and yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was saying, so the thought process is basically, okay, you put Craig Kimbrell there in the ninth in a 2-2 game, and, and the hope is that the Orioles' bats can take the lead, potentially, and maybe you get another inning out of him, and he's able to close it out, correct? Or is that is that dumb to say? 
Yes, but I don't think with Kimbrell in that sense. I don't think the Orioles are saying, hey, Craig, we're going to have you go two innings this early because of his age and because of what they want him to be able to do for the full season. But that's a thought process. And the other thought process is the Orioles go, we're prioritizing this inning to get the extras. Maybe we put up two in the extra innings. And then the pressure's off the staff and we don't have to. I just think personally, Brandon Hyde made the decision, we're going to go to Kimbrell, and therefore we know that we just need to get it, get to extra innings and we'll figure it out after that. And it's different. But also what Felix Batista did, guys, like not many closers were, were closing out two inning games to get two inning saves. So I want to throw that out there too. It's very rare, but you do have to pick what you want to do, and Brandon Hyde and the Orioles chose to use Craig in that situation. There you Does go, Rob. We got you. We try to. I know there's a lot of comments. I wasn't able to, to say it all or see it all. But, guys, if you enjoy the show, hit that like and subscribe button. We do this Monday, Thursday, and whenever we kind of feel like it's Sunday, we'll sprinkle it in. I think we've had a great show. It's been a long day. We appreciate you guys taking the time. But I think it is time to get on out of here. Yeah. So, do I grab the glasses and we go? I think it's time. I'm all starting right. to rise. Start the music. Oh, my God. What? No, just like, Kevin. Just, just Kevin. keep going. <laughs> Love this. <laughs> well, that hey. does it for all of us. The Ryan Ripken Show. Hey. Hit that hey. like and subscribe button. Hey. Miss Kelly's hey. in the house. Hey, mom's in the house. Yeah, you know, she's in the house. Well, appreciate you, mom. Appreciate everyone out there. <laughs> As always, have a day, have a night. Enjoy the Red Sox series, and we will see you back here Thursday for a brand new edition of the Ryan Ripken Show. Peace. Woo-hoo. Do, 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 do. Ow, ow.